I'm Edgar, standing on the outskirts of Pine Barrens in New Jersey, fingers dancing on the grip of my sidearm. The evening wind rustles through the trees like whispers. My team, consisting of Tabitha, Xander, and Igor, stands firmly beside me prepared for an uncertain fate. We're a part of a task force that hunts down nightmarish creatures lurking in the shadows. Tonight's mission is crucial. We've been tasked with tracking down something monstrous that has left a gruesome trail behind it. Tabitha's radio crackles, and she signals us to move forward into the forest. As we silently creep through the thicket, I remember how my father used to talk about working on old cars with his buddies. Those nights back at home drifting away like smoke before our current reality. We found something, Igor mutters tensely, pulling us out of our thoughts. A small tent lies tattered in the bushes with what appears to be splatter marks. A glance inside confirms our suspicions. Some poor camper met a grisly fate here. The initial stages of this secret mission have already proven that we're dealing with a dangerous kind of predator, possibly beyond our experience. The tempo increases as we move deeper into Pine Barrens. Suddenly, Xander catches movement to our right. We see it, a creature moving at an unnerving pace towards us. However, before anyone can react or call for help, it vanishes just as fast as it appeared. Our tension raises with every discovery we make and close call we encounter. Tracking this beast becomes near impossible as darkness engulfs us entirely leaving only the moon to cast eerie shadows. We stumble upon a tree dripping crimson fluid from its torn bark another telling sign of our quarry's passing. This thing is a cruel instrument of destruction tearing through human life with its animalistic instincts whilst avoiding our gunfire and every attempt at capture. The blood-chilling howls echo in the night as we continue searching the woods for our prey. Each agonizing minute heightens the sense of dread that permeates the group, yet humor remains our final defense against the panic clawing its way through. Xander grins nervously. You know, this reminds me of a career day in high school. I wanted to be a no-kill animal rescuer but ended up becoming a no-holds hunter instead. The woods fall silent, no rustling leaves, no chattering insects. And then it materializes once more, leaping into view with ferocious force. This creature is unlike anything we've seen before, standing on two legs and covered in matted hair from head to toe. It's displaying its enormous claws and bared fangs as if to taunt us, daring us to take it down. We burst into motion, zigzagging through the foliage in pursuit of this abomination. It charges back at us, unwilling to give a single inch of ground, and stubbornly evading any attempts at calling for backup. The chase continues through the night, each confrontation emboldening us even more. Our senses become attuned to every sound and breath of wind, bearing witness to an escalating race against time. Neither prey nor predator is willing to back down, an eerie ballet between hunter and hunted. As we push further into the dark corners of Pine Barrens, our paths cross more scars carved into the landscape by this enigmatic creature's wrath. Each mark stands as vile testament to its ability and prowess as an efficient killer. Despite every horror inflicted on us by this beast, we remain undeterred and resolute in our purpose, pursuing the nightmare relentlessly deep into unknown territory. I take point now, leading my team deeper into danger where our chances are slim, but there's no turning back. The moon hangs heavy in the sky, tightening its grip on our secret mission. We gather ourselves for a final decisive showdown with this violent scourge plaguing the unsuspecting world. We press on, using the blood-stained trail to guide us. Each broken branch or telltale fur tuft provides us with more clues about this creature's behavior. One of my team members, Tom, insists we call for help, 
but Sarah says that doing so would only slow us down and weaken the element of surprise. I agree with her. Our best chance is to take it by surprise, given that it seems relentless and unstoppable. Suddenly, the creature bursts through the thick brush before disappearing just as quickly. Its growls echo in the darkness, and I faintly hear my comrades inhales at its monstrous appearance. It's no wonder that this beast is a force to be reckoned with, well muscled with long arms ending in those massive claws and razor-sharp teeth that seem to gleam even in the darkness. I yell at my team to stay together. We can't let ourselves get separated. We know what has happened to previous victims when they face this monstrosity alone. I order them to lock their weapons on the creature, watch for any movements or signs of an attack. Our target bolts from one location to another. We try our best not to lose sight of it as we also dodge its attacks. It swipes menacingly catching James off guard and slicing through his armor. Blood spills onto the ground as he screams out in pain, cradling his injured arm. Dig in! Tom shouts, rallying our forces to protect James from further harm while providing ample cover fire against the beast. Taking charge once more, I assign two team members to handle James, now critical, condition. We fire upon the animal as it darts back out of sight. Several shots connect but cause minimal damage given its dense muscle mass. As we continue deeper into Pine Barrens, the environment grows more treacherous and unfamiliar. With every step closer towards the unknown, it feels as though we're getting further from safety and help. The creature shows no signs of fatigue as our pursuit seems futile. All the while, James' blood continues to stain the leaves and roots beneath our feet. We cannot help but feel the weight of his sacrifice, though spoken or acknowledged. Following a particularly vicious attack from the creature, Tom implores us to call for help once more. Seeing no other choice and recognizing that further delay might claim more lives, I reluctantly give in. We hope that with reinforcements— we might stand a fighting chance against this creature. A helicopter is sent to our coordinates for emergency extraction and backup. As we secure James onto a stretcher, the beast appears one last time with a triumphant snarl as if it realized that it had won this round. In this final standoff, we watch as the creature limps back into the dark forest, disappearing entirely. Though we could not defeat it this time, its flight into darkness suggests that our confrontation had taken a toll on it too. After securing James' evacuation, we make our way back to civilization. Our minds are filled with unanswered questions about what exactly this hostile creature is, perhaps a species unknown to science, or an anomaly that evades categorization. The reality remains unknown. As days turn into weeks after that harrowing night in Pine Barrens, I can't help but wonder if anything could have been done differently, if there was some other strategy we could have employed or any other way to effectively combat the monster that evaded us so skillfully. As I sit in my office surrounded by other agents, reports continue pouring in of similar brutal attacks. I take solace in knowing that my team and I did everything possible to stand up against this nightmare inflicted upon innocent victims by the creature cunningly hiding within Pine Barrens. And though our mission may have seemed inconclusive at best or failed at worst, the seeds of determination planted within us only served to strengthen our resolve. For now, one thing is clear, there may be no true winners in this struggle. The mysteries of Pine Barrens and the bloodthirsty creature that lurks within await our return. And return we shall, to confront the beast, get justice for our fallen comrade James, bring it peacefully into the light of understanding or force it to succumb in its dark abyss.
I, Jasper Thompson, stood on the outskirts of the dense forest in the isolated town of North Bow, Oregon. Tall trees loomed over me, casting shadows that seemed to whisper sinister tales. Inhaling deeply, I studied the entrance to a driving path, barely visible among the shrubbery. As part of a specialized task force dedicated to hunting and tracking monsters, I was no stranger to fear and bloodshed. Up until now, across countless missions, nothing had managed to truly unsettle me. Yet tonight felt different. Ever since I was young, I found solace in forests like this. The greenery and silence were once my refuge from a family that never quite understood my fascination with all things strange and out of the ordinary. But something about tonight's mission seemed off from the start. You good, Jasper? My colleague Holden Clark called from behind me. He patted my shoulder as he walked past me toward the entrance. His scrawny frame seemed almost frail compared to mine. Yeah, I replied curtly, suppressing a shudder while attempting to crack a smile. I hope you manage not to trip over your loose laces. Hey, we've got our jokes for survival. He winked as he tied his laces tightly. The task force had been called in for Naomi Kendricks, a local mother whose child disappeared three days ago while playing near the forest. Sightings of an animal-like creature created panic throughout the community. We assumed it must be this creature that took the child. Listen up, everyone, yelled our leader Anna Langley from our group huddled around her blackboard. We are dealing with two priorities, rescuing the child or recovering the body, and capturing or eliminating the creature responsible. As she detailed her plan while pointing at several points on our mission map, we listened attentively. Once briefed, we began equipping ourselves with specialized weaponry and tools to face the unknown threat. Our task force combed through the forest in a strategic formation. Holden had partnered with me, and together we walked further into the merciless darkness. Eerie silence enveloped us, broken only by the crunch of twigs beneath our boots and faint whispers over our communication devices. Suddenly, an ear-splitting scream cut through the air. Anna's voice crackled over our radios. Team 2, report! We picked up our pace and stumbled upon a grisly scene. Team member Isabel Stewart lay motionless on muddy ground, blood everywhere, limbs torn apart as if mauled by a ferocious beast. The entire team gathered at the site, panic evident in everyone's eyes. Our mission had taken a nightmarish turn that none of us were truly prepared for. It was clear, this was no ordinary monster that lurked in these woods. We continued walking through the darkness, more cautiously now, tense as steel wires. Anna paused to assess an odd-looking trail of indents on the damp forest floor when I caught something in my peripheral vision. There, lurking behind a distant tree, I spotted a hazy figure whose silhouette seemed too twisted to be human or animal. Its monstrous features could not be mistaken, sharp claws replacing fingers and feet grotesque patches of fur and scales covering its body. Its haunting eyes gleamed with menace. Before I could react or call for help, it slithered between shadows and vanished into the cold night air. In that fleeting moment I realized, our lives were not immune to danger while hunting these monsters. We teetered towards death with every step into their lairs. Trying to remain composed, I whispered into the radio. Guys, there's something out here with us. I saw something. The team exchanged concerned glances, but they didn't want to ignore a potential threat in the darkness. Anna nodded and made a quick decision. All right, we're going back to base. We need to regroup and figure out what we're up against. As we retreated towards our base camp, the unsettling feeling of being watched persisted. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. 
everything about this creature screamed danger. Arriving at base camp, we scanned our surroundings for anything suspicious. Emma switched on powerful floodlights mounted on trucks to illuminate the area, instantly banishing some of the shadows lurking around us. We should call for backup, suggested Ryan, visibly nervous. Anna considered it for a moment and replied, I don't want to draw more attention to ourselves. Whatever that thing is might be attracted by the commotion. We decided instead to fortify our temporary home, setting up a perimeter of tripwires rigged with noise-making devices and motion-activated floodlights. Night turned into morning with no further incidents. Although exhausted by fear and an uneasy feeling that someone or something was stalking us, we persisted in our quest. It was crucial that we located this monstrous predator before it could strike again. While examining a damaged security camera further along the trail, its metal casing shredded as if mauled by massive claws, Emma gasped. She held up her phone, displaying an image captured moments before the camera's destruction. In terrifying detail, the creature revealed itself, distorted limbs sprouting twisted claws, gaping maw filled with jagged teeth, elongated snout crowned with bloodshot eyes that seemed infinite in their malice and intelligence. Visibly shaking from fear but knowing there could be no escape without facing this monster head-on, we spent the day scouring the area for any signs of its den or territory, hoping to find it before it found us. As night fell once more, we returned to our fortified base, only to discover something that chilled us to our very core. A motion-activated light placed near the perimeter was missing, and in its place lay a mutilated deer carcass. The message was clear. This creature was not only intelligent but also taunting us. Determined not to succumb to fear, we took turns guarding our camp, weapons at the ready. We hoped the creature would launch a brazen attack against us, where we would have the advantage. However, it seemed as if fate had different plans for us. Instead of a direct onslaught, the creature struck from the shadows. A blood-curdling scream echoed through camp as a team member disappeared into the dark abyss beyond our perimeter. Knowing time was of the essence, I gathered what remained of my courage and hesitantly approached Anna. We need to send out a distress signal. Now. Conceding there were no other options left, she grabbed a flare gun from our supplies and fired it into the night sky. An eerie crimson glow illuminated our surroundings as we waited for help with bated breath. As if drawn by fear itself, heavy footsteps from an approaching search party soon joined the cacophony of chattering voices and barking dogs. Though concerned about potentially attracting more unwanted attention towards ourselves on arrival, Anna had called for backup. Their numbers might offer some protection against this abomination. Together with our reinforcements, we scanned the surrounding woods once more. No trace of either team members or our quarry could be found beyond pools of blood marking scenes of merciless carnage. The creature had vanished without a trace. Heading back toward base while pondering what transpired in these woods resulted in an epiphany. Perhaps this monster wasn't confined to cryptid legend but rather some horrific genetic abomination an unholy human-animal hybrid spawned from nefarious experiments on some secret, secluded laboratory. If correct, this revelation shocked dread into my very soul, but I can never be sure. As our weary search party finally neared home base, we cast weary gazes upon an apologetic dawn whose false hopes seemed tarnished by sinister shadow eagerly anticipating our next return. I'm Vincent, and this all started in the dense forest of Aokigahara, Japan. Our task force's mission was to locate any unidentified monsters living there. We specialize in hunting and tracking these beings, 
but none of our cases compared to what we encountered during that secret mission. My colleagues Mitch, Skyler, and Josette were with me. While we were used to living on the edge, this day felt unnerving, like it was playing host to something unknown. Not long after our arrival, we found a mutilated body that triggered our curiosity more than the usual sightings. The disarray resembled an art of violence, bones protruding from the skin at unnatural angles and clothing torn to shreds. We investigated further into the woods when Josette's voice cracked over the radio, her alarm evident as she gasped about another corpse she'd found. This time, it seemed like something had fed on its insides, leaving gaunt remnants behind. The horror took a new form. We'd never seen anything like it before. Tension ran high as the sun dipped behind the trees casting eerie shadows on the ground. Skylar muttered next to me. According to local legends, some animalistic beast is supposed to live here. I cut him off, reminding him not to be superstitious. However, I have to admit that his research impacted my mind when I noticed how unnaturally quiet the woods around us had become. As dusk morphed into darkness, we stayed vigilant for any creature hiding in plain sight. That's when it happened. A deafening growl pierced through the still air like an unsettling siren call. Anxiety rippled through us as we frantically looked for cover. What was that? Mitch demanded aloud while grasping his knife firmly. Suddenly, a large creature came into focus, bigger than any wild animal we'd ever encountered, characterized by scaly skin, horns, and an elongated face with multiple rows of razor-like teeth. Its eyes were like empty pools, a void that felt endless and terrifying. We exchanged glances, our hearts pounding in unison, as Mitch whispered, Call for backup. But every attempt was futile. Our communication seemed to have fatally failed. We couldn't ignore the fact that whatever this creature was, we were on our own now. The grotesque being and its disheveled hair reeked of rotting flesh. As it sneered menacingly at us, my mind wandered back to my days of living alone, grappling with my inner demons. But nothing could compare to the horrifying reality in front of me. Feeling cornered and vulnerable, we reacted on impulse. I shot at the creature as my team reached for their guns in unison too. A metallic symphony tore through the silence, bullets whizzing past us like impatient raindrops. However, they seemed to have no effect on the beast. Instead, it only fueled its monstrous wrath. It lunged forward with tremendous speed that should have been impossible for its size. With lethal force, it clawed into Skylar's face. A blood-curdling scream tore from his throat. We managed to drag him away from the predator but knew he never survived the brutal damage inflicted upon him. Despair set in as we retreated further into the forest. I couldn't help wonder who else would die before we stopped this abomination. In all my years working or leading these missions, I had never faced such perilous terror that didn't submit even in the face of deadly gunfire. Headlights pierced through the darkness ahead as we stumbled upon an abandoned vehicle amidst the trees, evidence of other lives once lost to this nefarious enemy. Suddenly, there it was again. The creature pounced out from behind the car, leaving scratch marks so deep in the bodywork that the metal shrieked in response. We blocked its path and braced for impact. With no time to waste, I yelled to my team, we have to keep moving. This monster won't stop. We sprinted through the dark forest, adrenaline pumping through our veins, pursued by the relentless beast. I spared a glance back to see its grotesque form closing in on us. It was a hairless creature with sharp teeth and long, twisted limbs that scraped the ground as it lurched forward. As we ran, I couldn't help but berate myself for not calling for backup earlier. Our radios had stopped working the moment the creature appeared, 
leaving us isolated and alone in hostile territory. It's as if it knew, knew just how vulnerable we'd be without any outside support. The creature let out a guttural roar that sent chills down my spine. I could sense its anger and frustration at not being able to catch us yet. It was getting closer now. I could hear its heavy breathing gaining on us with each passing second. We need to find higher ground. We can't outrun this thing, shouted one of my teammates. Like divine intervention, we stumbled upon a small cliff with a narrow path leading to the top. With desperate haste, we scrambled up the steep incline, some slipping on loose rocks but managing a steady pace nonetheless. Once atop the plateau, our hearts pounded against our chests like thunder in a storm. Our lungs burned, but there was no time to recover. We had to devise a plan to stall or deter this monstrous predator. My gaze fell upon our surroundings, spotting some rocks and debris littered across the area. An idea quickly formed in my mind. Help me gather these rocks, I instructed my team. We'll have to try and buy ourselves some time. As they piled up heavy stones nearby, the creature could be heard growing nearer. It would make its ascent any second now. Sweat dripped from brows in anticipation, while our hands tightened around the rocks we chose as makeshift weapons. We formed a defensive circle, waiting until the creature was in sight. Seconds felt like hours as we prepared for the imminent showdown. The beast lunged forward, emerging onto the plateau with ferocity that matched its grotesque appearance. But we were ready. On my signal, we all hurled our rocks at the creature with all our strength. Several hit their mark, momentarily stunning it. Desperate, we continued throwing anything available, branches, lumps of dirt, keeping distance between us and it. In a stroke of luck, one rock struck the creature directly between its eyes. A piercing howl erupted from it as it staggered back and slipping on loose rocks by the cliff's edge. Taking our chance, we pinned it down using more large rocks that lay scattered nearby, hoping to buy us time to escape or figure out what to do with this abomination. Its enraged screams echoed throughout the forest, making my ears ring and threatening to break my resolve under its weight. Despite this, I couldn't help but wonder, what was this creature? Why did bullets have no effect on it? We need to go, said one of my teammates, snapping me back to reality. That thing won't be trapped for long. We have to get help. We carefully climbed down from the cliffside, leaving the immobilized beast behind. Pausing only for a brief moment of silence for Skylar, gone too soon in our battle against this malevolent entity, we rushed to find our way back to safety. Hours later, exhausted and haunted by the horrors we'd witnessed, we made our way to civilization and reported the incident to authorities. After providing detailed accounts about the creature's features and behavior as well descriptions of where our unthinkable encounter occurred, they responded with a quiet intensity that left us even more unnerved. In the coming days, the beast would be discovered, captured and held under strict containment, classified as an unknown, but now subdued threat. However, the knowledge that such a menacing entity existed left an indelible mark on my psyche. The world felt more dangerous than it had before our fateful mission. As I lay in bed, my dreams were plagued with images of the creature, its twisted limbs, jagged teeth, and unrelenting pursuit. The nightmares served as a constant reminder that somewhere out there, hidden within the shadows of the unknown, we had met and survived true horror's true incarnation. I'm Malcolm, and my boots crunch on the damp forest floor as I stalk through the dark woods near Thompson, Illinois. Sure, a secret government task force for hunting monsters sounds like a joke, 
but trust me, the things I've seen will make your blood run cold. Before joining this task force, I was an ordinary police officer in a small town. Days were slow and nights above average. That all changed when the first reports came in about missing people friends and neighbors disappearing without a trace. It sent shivers down my spine. We are four in our team sent to track this creature, Amelia and Ethan on either side of me and Lawrence taking up the rear. Each of us holds a firearm at the ready. We were dispatched to find whoever or whatever was responsible for these gruesome scenes we had encountered. There's something unsettling about these woods tonight, Amelia whispers. You said it, Lawrence replies with a nervous chuckle. I knew a guy who got lost in here once. Was never really the same after they found him. Ethan clears his throat abruptly stopping all conversation as he drops into a crouch next to something on the ground. He looks incredibly focused as he examines what appears to be a piece of torn clothing nearby. Dread gnaws at me as we move forward, our flashlights barely denting the darkness surrounding us. Suddenly, the hoot of an owl overhead causes us to jolt with surprise, a reminder that nature can be full of surprises too. Just when we start feeling more at ease, we come across one of those grisly scenes, gore splattered across some bushes, severed limbs on the ground. I blink away nausea and urge myself to keep moving. The sound of rustling leaves makes us tense up as one, slowly scanning our surroundings we see, nothing, as if whatever disturbed those leaves vanished just beyond our sight. I move forward cautiously. We're missing the creature's path, then the wind carries a sound to us someone in the distance on their cell phone. He hello? They stammer, their voice weak with fear. I think I found. Then there's just silence. We race towards the voice, and I can feel my pulse pounding in my ears as adrenaline courses through me. Not much further ahead, we find the caller, Victoria huddled against a tree, her phone still clutched in her hand. Her eyes wide with terror as she points out the creature she saw. The creature is large like an ancient bear but has sharp claws like talons, a muscular body covered in mottled fur and scales, at once recognizable as parts of various animals but coming together into something twisted and monstrous. It looks back at us with a predatory gleam in its yellow eyes. We exchange glances, none of us daring to call for help lest we attract even more of these creatures to our position besides we knew our orders were very clear. Terminate on sight. Our team spreads out around the creature, attempting to flank it while Amelia offers outward support. As we close in on it step by step, I can feel my hands trembling ever so slightly. However, every muscle in my body is tense for action as all sounds around us seem to mute aside from this strange beast breathing heavily before us. Suddenly, the creature lunges at Victoria, who lets out a piercing scream. Amelia takes a shot, and the bullet grazes its shoulder, forcing it to recoil in pain. The strategies we discussed earlier are abandoned as panic overtakes us. Run! I yell, and our group scrambles back towards our vehicles. The creature's angry growls and the sound of heavy footfalls behind us confirm that it's following. Get in the cars, now! I yell as we reach them. We all pile into separate vehicles, slamming doors shut and starting engines immediately. Get on the radio and call for backup. I shout to Ben, who is shaking but quickly complies. Frantically, our engines rev as we attempt to put distance between ourselves and the monstrous creature pursuing us. It swiftly catches up to one vehicle, charging into it with immense force and launching it off the road, Paul's car. We watch in horror as it flips over multiple times before crashing into a tree. Paul! I scream, helpless. There isn't time to help him. 
We need to get out of here before that thing kills us all. Amelia guns our vehicle forward, leaving Ben no choice but to report our desperate situation. This is Unit 4 requesting immediate backup. We have an unknown hostile creature attacking us. The radio crackles back almost instantly. Copy that, Unit 4. Additional units are en route. ETA 10 minutes. Those 10 minutes feel like a lifetime as we flee from the relentless assailant. Suddenly, the ground shakes beneath us as enormous bursts of water erupt from the earth on either side of our path home. As if it weren't enough to be hunted by a horrifying hybrid beast, now nature itself seems intent on sealing our doom. Amelia continues driving at top speed despite impaired visibility from the geyser's spray. Like a terrible specter from a nightmare, our foe refuses to relent. It smashes through the watery obstacles with an unnatural drive, remaining hot on our heels. Finally, we hear sirens approaching. Backup has arrived. With a sigh of relief mixed with dread, Amelia slams on the brakes just before reaching the roadblock set up by our colleagues. The creature emerges from the water-streaked roadway like a horror straight out of myth. Officers open fire simultaneously, bullets raining down upon it from all sides. It roars in pain even as it continues attacking everyone within reach. I watch helplessly as several officers are mauled by its massive claws or crushed beneath its powerful form. Despite these brutal losses, we rally and persist in filling the monster with lead until it finally collapses. Paramedics arrive, tending to the injured and assessing those lost to the creature's vengeance. In the chaos, I make my way over to what remains of Paul's car and find his lifeless body entangled with twisted metal and shattered glass. A wave of grief washes over me as I realize that we have paid a heavy price for our survival, one that may haunt us forever. As the carnage is cleared away, questions arise about what we have just experienced. What exactly was this monstrous being? How could such a creature have come into existence? What drove it to attack us so ferociously? None of us have answers yet, but soon enough someone will want them. Until that day comes, all that is left for us to do is remember those who bravely fought and fell in this deadly battle against a formidable adversary far beyond our understanding. I'm Simon, and I work for a task force that hunts and tracks monsters. Today, we're stationed somewhere deep in the Appalachian Mountains, awaiting our next assignment. The dense forest has an eerie silence as birdsong from earlier ceased abruptly. I remember growing up in a small town not too far from here. Life was simple then. My team leader, Gideon Blakely, Join me by the fire while waiting for others to return with more information on our target. He cracked a light-hearted joke about how cold it was and wished he'd brought warmer socks. The recon squad returned half an hour later with a gruesome sight, body parts strewn about, blood painting the foliage. Elena Suarez, a member of our unit, described in detail how she found them. They were experienced hikers who met their end in this wretched forest. With no time to waste, we began tracking what had killed those poor souls, some sort of animalistic creature, unlike any we'd ever encountered before. Our search led us through thickets of twisted branches and into a clearing bathed in moonlight. A sound caught our attention. It was like multiple growls combined into one guttural tune. Our hands gripped our weapons as adrenaline surged through us. There it stood, an unknown beast silhouetted against the night sky. Its massive frame towered over us like an asymmetrical nightmare come true. It had horns on its misshapen head and quills covering its body like armor. The creature eyed us hungrily before letting out a deafening roar that shook the ground beneath our feet. 
As a team, we moved in formation and opened fire, but it hardly seemed phased by our projectiles. It charged toward us with intense speed despite its heavy frame. Marcus Fitzgerald, another teammate of ours, made the mistake of letting his surprise linger for too long. In a flash, the beast was upon him, sinking its grotesque fangs into his shoulder. Marcus screamed in agony as the creature tossed him aside like a ragdoll. The rest of us continued to fire at the monstrous entity as it tore through our ranks with ease. It was all too clear that conventional weapons were ineffective against this beast. In a frenzy of action, Gideon shouted at me to find cover and call for backup. I scrambled away from the chaos, heart pounding like a jackhammer, and found temporary safety behind an enormous oak. Surrounded by death and carnage, I yelled into my radio requesting urgent assistance. As if in response to my plea, the forest once again fell eerily silent. Hidden amongst the trees, awaiting reinforcements, I chanted a mantra I'd learned as a child to keep my nerves steady. The pain lancing through my injuries made it difficult to focus. Did you hear that? Elena whispered through chattering teeth, pale and wide-eyed as she huddled beside me. Unable to respond due to fear prickling down my spine, I simply stared at Elena and wondered who would be next. Before we had any more time to ponder on our fate or plan an escape route, the sound of snapping branches echoed through the woods. The monstrous silhouette emerged yet again, its blood-red eyes filled with malice. Suddenly, I realized our only chance of survival was to fight back, but not with weapons. Those were useless. Instead, I looked for the creature's weaknesses. That's when I noticed it. Every time we fired at it, the creature flinched from the sound. Everyone! Yell as loud as you can! I shouted to my remaining teammates. They seemed confused but followed my lead. Our collective screams echoed through the forest, disorienting the creature momentarily. It recoiled and stumbled away from us. Backing away from the beast, we moved quickly while still trying to maintain a close eye on it. The creature roared in frustration and charged us once again. Make more noise! Gideon commanded, understanding my strategy. We clapped our hands and banged on tree trunks to create even more noise, trying to pierce its sensitive hearing. The creature screeched in pain with each increasing wave of sound. One of my teammates dashed off toward our vehicles parked at a nearby clearing. I've got an idea, he hollered. While we continued making noise, our teammate returned dragging a large metal plate behind him a spare part from one of our armored vehicles. Everyone grab something. Hit this plate as hard as you can, he instructed. We quickly complied, using weapon stocks and other objects to strike the metal plate loudly. The resulting cacophony assaulted the monster's ears. The effect was immediate. It writhed in pain and collapsed to its knees. Our team took advantage of this momentary weakness and rushed at the creature, restrained it with any material we could find, ropes, chains, and even branches torn from trees, tightly securing it so that it couldn't break free. As we stepped back to survey our makeshift capture, I noticed something about the creature. It had clear physical traits resembling various wild animals, parts of a bear, a wolf, and an elk but it was nothing I'd ever encountered before. It seemed like some hybrid beast, a freak of nature. How could such a creature even exist? Elena, still trembling, turned to me with an intense look in her eyes. What are we going to do with it? She asked. Call for backup and report this creature, I replied. They must know about it. Maybe they'll have some answers. While we watched the subdued beast, Gideon spoke up solemnly. We should remember Marcus and others who didn't make it. Their sacrifice led us here. 
I nodded in agreement, honoring those we had lost in the horrifying attack. Finally, our backup arrived along with two teams of researchers who had experience dealing with unidentified creatures. As they took over, documenting the details and planning their transport of the creatures safely away from here for study, I couldn't help but wonder what other unknown dangers might be lurking out there. Together, we had survived this encounter and learned the importance of adapting to unprecedented situations. The haunting memory of our fallen friends would stay with us forever, a reminder always to stay vigilant as we face new challenges in the uncertain world that we lived in. I'm Weston, and this was my first assignment for the Monster Hunting Task Force. The sun was setting over the dense redwood forest in Northern California while I approached the location where mysterious murders had been taking place. My family had a long lineage in law enforcement, and that dedication trickled down to me. Growing up in small-town America made me wary of the unknown. So, when the agency sought experts to combat these monstrous threats, I felt compelled to join. My comrades, Marlo Bradshaw and Nellie Wilkerson, accompanied me on our mission to uncover the gruesome abnormalities plaguing the area. Whispers stirred among locals about a half-human predator that prowled through darkness, but hard evidence remained elusive. Upon reaching the campsite, Nellie began setting up communication equipment, while Marlo scouted our surroundings for any clues linked to recent killings. Hey, Weston, Marlow shouted from afar. Check this out, scratch marks on trees in an odd pattern. We studied them carefully, taking note of their unique shapes and trying to discern if they held any meaning. Suddenly a sharp scream echoed through the forest. It was Nellie. Racing back to camp, our hearts pounded as we found her trembling by the equipment. Something had stalked her movements from behind a cluster of bushes but luckily fled as we approached. Hush now, I whispered, eyeing the trembling branches. Nobody dares disturb us. We are trained professionals. Weeks passed without much progress. Victims were still following their last breaths with no real culprits in sight, just stories of sinister shadows lurking around. One night as we sat around our campfire sharing personal anecdotes, Marlowe revealed his explosive temper after discovering his wife's unfaithfulness. He joked that it explained why he seemed at home when hunting vicious beasts. As dawn broke on an unusually foggy morning, an eerily silent forest embraced us. My team devised a plan to force an encounter with the beast. We'd create a secure perimeter, lure it into our space, and apprehend it. The trap was a success. The savage creature revealed itself to us after stalking some bait we placed. Memorable features screamed a chilling crossbreed between man and animal. Its limbs elongated, its feral eyes glinted under the moonlight, and its body had an unnatural hunch. Razor-sharp teeth protruded from its snarling lips as it growled in fury and lunged at me. I've got your back, yelled Marlow as we tried to subdue the beast. With calculated precision, we cornered the cunning monster after an exhausting chase. Its blood-curdling screams pierced our ears as we prepared to bring an end to this nightmare hovering over a terrified town. Concluding that this was indeed responsible for gruesome murders plaguing our community, we skirted danger boldly with victory one grasped heartbeat away. As the creature lunged towards me, my only thought was to survive and make sure my team and I could escape this horrifying scene. The creature was focused on me, so my only weapon was my agility, trying to evade its ferocious claws as calling for help wouldn't provide any assistance in time. I scrambled to keep the distance between me and the monster, 
expressing in action alone the desperate hope that my team might buy enough time to find a way to handle it. While I distracted the creature with my swift movements, I heard Marlow call out, Hold it off! We're coming up with a plan! His voice was strained due to his injured leg suffered during a skirmish at the beginning of our hunt, but his determination was still firm despite it. I knew I couldn't count on him or anyone else physically subduing the beast. We had to be smart about our approach. The creature snarled as if sensing Marlowe's strategy, shifting its attention from me towards the rest of the team. Fear and instinct told me that this was an opportunity for escape, but our mission would only be accomplished if we succeeded in trapping the beast. In a brief moment of opportunity, one of our teammates swiftly unleashed strong nets around the creature while it lunged at Shannon, one of our team members. Its movements became increasingly impaired as it struggled against the heavy restraints. Smothering its ferocity and snarls through sheer force imposed by numbers, we contained it directly enough that it no longer presented an immediate danger. Once tamed by our combined efforts, it appeared less monstrous than under the blood-red moonlight that cast dark shadows around us mere moments ago. A tense silence filled the air as we finally observed in more detail this creature one suffering from mutation and pain incomprehensible to any normal being. Its eyes watered with fear as it whined quietly, its aggression neutered by the vivid reality of its capture. It was clear that this particular creature was a victim of genetic alteration from a cruel experiment, perhaps even unwillingly transformed into its current state. As we pondered what to do next with the beasts, sirens filled our ears in the distance, and we immediately knew that local law enforcement was on their way. We couldn't afford to have this creature escape and potentially harm more innocent lives as long as it breathed within the same space as the hunters. However, my strong aversion to killing tormented me throughout the polished steel of my gun. Marlow picked up on my hesitation and said, we can sedate it for now, keep it unconscious until we figure out how to handle it better. Even though someone created this monster, it's not our mission to play judge or executioner. He removed a tranquilizer gun from his bag, fitted Uli, specialized in medical aid, with the rifle, and ordered her to take a shot at the creature which was successful. The beast closed its eyes, drifting into speedy slumber. The campfire crackled softly in the night when law enforcement arrived on the scene a short while later. We prepared ourselves to answer an array of questions and offer plausible explanations for our actions. While awaiting formal questioning and processing procedures from the police force collecting data at the scene, some team members muttered condolences for victims that couldn't avoid meeting their end through their encounters with the monster. Jake recalled a conversation he had with Tony about his newborn baby girl, mere days before his unfortunate demise at one of our captured beasts' first ever murder scenes. Sarah shared her memories of working alongside Jenna when trying to solve one of her first ever cases. Each testimony added more weight to our desire for justice in every single case taken up by our team. I was stationed in the dense forests surrounding Akigahara, Japan, a place known for its eerie silence and disturbing history. I'm Jack Bronson. I introduced myself to the team, all of us part of an elite monster hunting task force. Before nightfall, we got acquainted with each other, Kevin Lee, a seasoned tracker, Sophie Clark, a weapons expert, and Kaido Suzuki, our liaison officer. As dusk settled in, it became apparent that something was terribly wrong. Inexplicably, multiple people had gone missing within the past fortnight. The disappearance pattern seemed too well orchestrated to be coincidental. 
Our first encounter with the unknown came when we stumbled upon an abandoned campsite. The tents shredded apart gruesomely, as if mauled by a wild beast. Fresh blood streaked the ground. Kaido cracked a tense joke to ease the atmosphere. We ventured deeper into Eikigahara and heard whispers about a former local legend that involved a terrifying creature living in these woods. We were skeptical but noticed the fear growing louder as we continued our mission. On the third day, while following a trail of displaced foliage and crushed branches, we came face to face with our target, an animalistic beast whose existence we never anticipated. It stood on its hind legs and unleashed an earth-shattering roar that reverberated within our very bones. The creature was unlike anything we had ever witnessed, razor-sharp claws, coarse black fur matted with blood, and rows of sharpened teeth glistening with drool as it lunged towards us. We fought instinctively but struggled to match the monster's unparalleled agility and strength. Sophie unloaded round after round into the creature while Kaido slashed at it with his machete. Their efforts appeared almost futile. Kevin began maneuvering us into a more strategic position, while I tried to recall if anything I had learned could aid us in combating this deadly foe. Kaido, during lulls in the fighting, relayed stories of the beast passed down within his culture. Legends described a monster that adapted its hunting techniques and grew stronger with each passing generation. It was a chilling thought that we were up against an ancient murderous adversary. As we fought, narrowly escaping death several times, we attempted to call for backup. Our radios crackled with static and interference, leaving us isolated with the increasing hopelessness of our situation. During a particularly tense battle exchange between Kevin and the creature, it managed to slash past his defenses. His fate was sealed as life drained from his body. It was a sobering reminder of what awaited us all if we failed. Now down by one person, our prospects dimmed. Despite our dwindling numbers, we forged ahead with renewed determination, blending our expertise for the greater cause. Sophie exchanged quips and sarcastic remarks, providing levity in this harrowing situation, while I recounted my childhood as an orphan. It added a human touch to the traumatic experience. Despite all odds and with relentless dedication, we devised a plan to outsmart the beast. Each of us put aside our fears and doubts for the sake of justice and retribution. It wasn't long before the creature had cornered Sophie at the edge of a cliff, rocky spikes jutting into the sky below. Endeavoring to crush the beast once and for all, we sprung into action to execute our strategy. Sophie's back was against the cliff. The creature's sharp talons glistened as its instincts kicked in, ready to end her life. My heart pounded, but I couldn't waste a second more. Kaido and I looked at each other, silently nodding in agreement that now was the time to act. We sprang into action, executing our plan with calculated precision. Kaido threw a rock, aiming for the creature's attention. As it hesitated and turned to face him, I leaped onto its back, grabbing hold of its coarse fur with both hands. The creature screeched in frustration as it tried to shake me off. Its eyes were a hollow black with red veins surrounding them. The sheer strength and power emanating from the beast was terrifying in itself. Sophie, now free from the cornered position, swiftly climbed down the side of cliff, barely making it to a secure ledge below. Kaito grabbed a sharp branch, waiting for the perfect opportunity as he circled around the distracted creature. The beast's frustration amplified as I held on tightly. It reeled, attempting to pluck me off its back with its talons but missing every time. With Sophie safely out of harm's way and my grip weakening on the creature's back, we had only one chance left to end this nightmare. As Kaido closed in with his makeshift weapon, he shouted at me. Now! 
I let go of the creature's fur and landed hard onto rocky ground just as Kaido lunged forward with his makeshift spear. He stabbed it right through the beast's chest, nailing it to one of the jutting rocks on the edge of the cliff. The creature wailed in agonizing pain before it finally fell silent and limp, life draining from its terrifying form. It was over. Our breaths were heavy as we stared down at our slain foe. After helping Sophie get back up from the ledge, we sat down, our relief palpable. We remembered Kevin, whose laughter and wit would never be shared again. Our hearts were heavy with grief for our fallen friend, but we couldn't mourn yet, not until we found a way out of this place. With no working radios to call for help, we chose to navigate through the treacherous terrain on foot with hopes of finding civilization. It took hours of walking before we saw sweet salvation in the form of distant city lights. Upon our safe return to civilization and our debrief at headquarters, the creature's demise was met with mixed emotions. The loss of Kevin left a gaping hole in our hearts, but we clung to the other's presence, knowing that our bonds had grown stronger through this ordeal. We may never fully understand what exactly that creature was, or how it developed its horrifying hunting techniques. Our encounter left more questions than answers, but that's not an unusual result in a world filled with mysteries lurking in every corner. What mattered was taking a stand against something monstrous and inhumane, working together to protect each other from an unspeakable evil. We would carry the memories of this harrowing battle for the rest of our lives making sure it would never be forgotten. As I looked up into the night sky one final time before leaving that location behind forever, I couldn't help but wonder whether there were more creatures like that one lurking on earth, just waiting for the right time to strike. It was a question that would haunt me for years to come, but one thing was certain, we'd faced an unimaginable foe, and through teamwork and unbreakable bonds, we defeated it together. My name is Carter Johnson, and I'm standing in the dense Appalachian forest, feeling the nerve-wracking stillness as I wait for my fellow hunters. We're part of a specialized task force notorious for tracking and hunting monsters that pose a threat to humanity. As we set out on our secret mission, I recall my personal experience growing up on a simple farm in rural Georgia. It's important for me to remain down-to-earth and focused on our objective. The task force is filled with people like me, people who faced monstrous tragedies and managed to come out stronger. The team consists of Marvin Walker, our marksman, Lee Morgan, an expert tracker, and Sasha Ivanov, our communication officer. We work like clockwork, with each person taking the responsibility they were assigned. Our faith in one another is what makes us strong, even when faced with unspeakable horrors. Before long, we reach a gruesome scene. Several missing persons from the nearby town had been eviscerated in a brutal attack. I fight back the bile rising in my throat. Nothing could prepare us for something so disturbing. After analyzing the evidence left behind at the scene, Lee deduces the direction in which the monster had escaped, leading us deeper into the woods. The terrain becomes treacherous as thick vegetation consumes our path, and tensions rise among us as we tighten our grip on guns. Suddenly, we hear rustling leaves and shallow breaths cut through the deafening silence of the night. From behind an ancient oak tree emerges an enormous creature that I had never laid eyes upon before. Its flesh peels from its muscular frame as it lumbers towards us with unnatural speed. Its massive claws leave deep grooves in the forest floor while oversized fangs protrude from a grotesque maw that stretches wider than seems possible. As adrenaline courses through me, I grasp firm onto my weapon only to realize it's useless against such an otherworldly opponent. 
Marvin fires several shots into the beast's chest, the sound echoing like thunder through the treetops. But it barely falters as my heart sinks from a fleeting ray of hope. Protect the others! I yell, charging at the creature in an act of desperation. Using my training to execute a series of strategic maneuvers, I draw its attention, giving my teammates enough time to call for backup. I'm acutely aware that their help won't arrive soon enough. It's up to me in this twisted dance with death. As the nightmarish monster lunges for my exposed throat, I barely dodge out of its reach in time. I curse under my breath, not because the task force shouldn't have been warned about this monster's existence, but because it didn't seem like anything that could exist on this earth at all. As though picking up on my thoughts, Sasha exclaims over our communication device with shaky breath. Guys! Reports say it could be a skinwalker, a creature that can transform into any animal shape. The menacing creature continues its relentless assault, and we fight back with everything we've got. Panic and disbelief fuel our adrenaline, forcing us to dig deeper for survival than ever before. Amidst the life-or-death chaos, creeping doubt snags at the back of our minds. Is this truly a skinwalker? Could they even exist as more than folklore? Logic and reason battle against what stands before us as we try to make sense of what seems to defy explanation. But there's no time for lingering uncertainty. The onslaught doesn't relent. It only increases in intensity as hairs stand on end and primal fear courses through every beat of our hearts. We edge closer to desperate despair. Every shot fired seems futile as they only serve to push us past our limits. Even if we survive this night, how can we ever feel safe again? In those dark moments, our communication device crackles to life, finality sinking heavy in Sasha's choked-out words. Backup is still too far out. It's up to us. Realizing that backup would not arrive in time, our team had to work together to confront this monstrous creature. We could no longer afford to dwell on whether or not it was a skinwalker. Our sole focus was on survival. I glanced over at Sasha while evading another vicious lunge and tried to convey the urgency in my eyes. We need to find a way to slow it down, at least, Sasha said, searching for any possible weakness in the monster. Let's try something unconventional. I yelled across the fray as we continued our feeble attempts at repelling the creature from attacking us. If it can change its shape, perhaps we can trick it into transforming into something less dangerous. We decided to call for help one last time before enacting our desperate plan. We didn't know why our calls were going unanswered, but this idea seemed like the only viable option to survive. Much like a pack of animals drawing in a predator, we all moved closer together. As the creature lunged at us again, we swiftly moved aside and scattered, forcing the monstrosity into a dead-end trap of its own creation. Feigning injury, I shouted. Guys, it bit me. I think, I think I'm turning into, into something. The others joined forcefully pantomiming excruciating pain while groaning and collapsing wordlessly on the ground. As hoped, this apparent weakness piqued the creature's interest. It hesitated before adopting a more defensive stance. It studied us with its glowing eyes that seemed disturbingly human while we writhed and twisted on the ground, pretending to suffer some unknown transformation. The ploy worked. The creature grew agitated and confused by our transformation display. It suddenly let out an ear-splitting screech and shifted form in front of our eyes. Instead of the gargantuan terror that was attacking us moments ago, a human-like figure stood, bewildered. Seizing the opportunity, we quickly overcame our shock and sprinted towards one of the task force's armed vehicles parked nearby. We could hear the sounds of the confused human-like creature behind us, but he didn't follow, perhaps still disoriented from our trick. 
With shaky hands, I locked the doors and started the engine. My team members, tired and weary from the chaos, exhale in relief as we sped away from what could have been our demise. The creature had turned into something far less threatening thanks to our last-ditch effort. Once at a safe distance, we reported back to headquarters about the terrifying encounter and our narrow escape. What they told us brought us to a halt. Other specialized teams, like ours, had encountered similar monsters that defied explanation. It seemed that this was only the beginning. Days passed, and we mourned those who had fallen to the creature's relentless assault. We struggled to comprehend what we had seen and whether it was an isolated incident or indicative of something more sinister. Measures were taken to ensure that backup wouldn't be delayed again like that fateful day. As news spread about these mysterious creatures, whispers grew about a new threat looming over humanity. But despite our fear, one thing became certain, faced with an unknown enemy— it was up to us to adapt and survive. In the end, it took just days for these terrifying incidents became all but forgotten, despite shreds of evidence collected by specialized teams like ours. What these creatures were portrayed might be forever out of reach for ordinary people to comprehend or even know existed. However, in those darkest moments when primal fear takes hold as though rooted deep within humanity's shared memory, with each hair standing on end like an antenna. We would remember everything about that night, the glowing eyes filled with malice lurking only inches from annihilation, how fragile life seemed as we came face to face with the stuff of nightmares. And we would truly appreciate that even though we couldn't eradicate evil completely, we could learn to adapt and survive. For those who knew the true face of terror, the horrors would never be forgotten. I'm Carl, part of a specialized monster hunting task force, and my team and I had been dispatched to the dense woods outside by Eloisa, Poland. The forest, shrouded in perpetual mist, was regarded as one of the last primeval ecosystems in Europe. Our mission seemed simple enough, find the creature lurking within and neutralize it before more lives were lost. Muffled voices echoing through our earpieces prevented a deafening silence from surrounding us as we moved stealthily among unruly branches and thick underbrush. Our leader, Alexandra Lewandowska, gave firm directions as we navigated the almost impenetrable tree line. Unnerved, my anxiousness must have been noticeable as my close friend and colleague, Maximilian Nowak, whispered to me with a mischievous glint in his eye. Carl, remember when you mistook that old lady's dog for a werewolf one time? Suppressing a chuckle at the memory, I countered with a grin. Well, Maximilian's not your typical pet name now, is it? As we bantered back and forth with Alexandra occasionally interjecting sharper responses for us to maintain our focus, we stumbled upon an oddly empty clearing. The spot revealed signs of struggle, remnants of yesterday's grisly attack. Though I'm not one to entertain gruesome details, what remained could only be described as organs torn apart. This was unlike anything documented in our files of previously eliminated creatures. Cautiously scanning our surroundings for clues on the creature's location or possible habitats led to little success. The creature appeared elusive but persistent in its sanguine ritual. Contact with seemingly familiar faces in nearby towns led to speculation, rumors of a relentless animal instinctively driven by hunger or some sinister purpose. A sense of panic filled the air as they recounted their horror stories of late-night encounters around by Louisa. People had simply vanished, leaving only scant evidence of their horrifying fate. One such anecdote focused on a frantic mother whose child had disappeared in the night, hysterically pleading for assistance 
and inexplicably clutching a mound of dark fur in her hands. Even the seasoned team members were on edge, and nobody could shake the gnawing feeling they experienced upon hearing these stories. Gradually assembling a profile of the monster based on witness accounts, one feature consistently stood out, striking red eyes that gleamed like embers in the darkness of the forest. Despite extensive reconnaissance and interviews with countless locals, we remained in the dark regarding its physiology. Numerous tense nights spent tracking the creature culminated in those dreaded red eyes manifesting themselves in our presence. Dangerously close, the creature's newfound proximity took us by surprise as it silently observed us from the edge of our makeshift campsite. Fear solidified our expressions when we realized it had been skulking here all along. Suddenly, it lunged towards us with breathtaking speed. Alexandra moved expertly to counter its assault, her years of training coming to bear in this heart-stopping moment. As Alexandra grappled with the monstrous creature, I noticed how surprisingly humanoid it was, despite its distinctive animal-like features. It was covered in dark fur and had claws the size of a bear's, but its form was undoubtedly that of a bipedal entity with limbs proportionate to a human's. Though we were all trained professionals, our group was still ill-equipped to face such an adversary. We scrambled to our feet and retreated, watching in horror as Alexandra fended off the beast. Our phones were tucked away in our bags, but even if we could call for help, it would take far too long for assistance to arrive in this remote forest. My colleagues shouted advice and words of encouragement to Alexandra as they retrieved weapons from their backpacks, anything that could provide a fighting chance against the creature. I followed suit and managed to retrieve my sidearm, though I knew it would do little good against this seemingly unstoppable beast. The creature stared into Alexandra's eyes, fixating her with its menacing red gaze. She didn't waver in her determination to protect us from it. As the creature lunged at her once more, she managed to strike a powerful blow with her knife. However, the impact barely seemed to phase the monster. Our group leader Sergei took aim at the creature with his hunting rifle and fired several shots towards its torso. The metallic clang of bullets striking its body echoed through the air as we witnessed small sparks fly off from the impacts. The creature barely flinched as it continued to attack Alexandra relentlessly. I dove into my bag for any other weapon that could potentially harm this horrifying creature. My fingers slid over a flare gun, and I quickly loaded a round into its barrel. Aiming directly at those disturbing red eyes, I squeezed the trigger. A brilliant glow exploded from the flare as it rocketed toward the creature's face. In a stroke of luck, it struck the monster squarely in its right eye. It recoiled in pain, emitting an ear-piercing screech that resonated throughout the forest. While the creature was momentarily distracted, Sergei landed a crushing kick to its side, sending it tumbling into the dense foliage. Alexandra lay on the ground breathing heavily, her body coated in sweat and blood from her valiant efforts to ward off our attacker. We need to leave now, Sergei barked picking up Alexandra and supporting her weight as we fled deeper into the forest. As we crossed paths with panicked locals who had heard the commotion, they offered up places for us to hide. We could no longer trust the isolation of our previous campsite and needed a secure shelter within a populated area. My colleagues and I found sanctuary in an old barn offered by one of the townspeople. We settled uncomfortably on bales of hay and tried to make any sense of what had just occurred. Alexandra's battle wounds required medical attention that would only be available once we mustered enough courage to venture out into town. As the sun began to rise, its warm golden rays casting light on our weary faces, I couldn't help but feel a sinking sensation in my stomach. 
The beast that haunted these lands was more formidable than we could have ever imagined. Its primal ferocity seemingly driven by an unquenchable thirst for blood left us all shaken and afraid. When we finally dared exit our haven, seeking medical assistance for Alexandra, our discovery of mutilated animal corpses along the way served as gruesome yet essential evidence of this creature's existence. A cloud of dread hung over our group as we contemplated how such an entity could even exist. How is it possible that such a formidable predator remained well below humanity's radar? Its discovery would challenge long-held beliefs about the natural world and how much we truly know about the depths of the forests. As we left the forest and the macabre reality that unfolded within it, we vowed to never forget Alexandra's heroism and those that perished at the hands of that ferocious creature. While our deepest desire was to eradicate the beast within the Bailoiza woods, we knew that we would need reinforcements and more information to develop an effective strategy. Returning to our urban lives, we each carried with us a burden that would forever change how we viewed nature and just how unforgiving it can be. I'm Jackson Matthews, and I was staring down at the murky waters of the Everglades, just past the tree lean where Florida's swamps and forests melt together. This place had a beauty of its own, but its dangers were always lurking beneath the surface. A few comrades and I had been sent on an undercover mission for our secret task force called The Silver Line. We were known for hunting and tracking vicious monsters that defied logic and terrorized our world. My teammates consisted of Arden Hayes, a former Navy SEAL with an eye for detail, Kieran Strickland, our quick-witted strategist, Talia Emerson, an expert medic in unusual subjects, and me, the sharpshooter with experience in tackling supernatural threats. Our objective was to investigate reports of a monstrous creature that had been stalking these woods for some time. Hunters and tourists had gone missing, leaving behind nothing but torn clothes and shreds of unaired desperation. Our first night had passed without any unusual occurrences. The sun began to set as we sat around the campfire exchanging stories of previous missions. You remember that case in Louisiana with those huge reptiles? Asked Kieran, smirking as he roasted a marshmallow. Arden snorted. Never did find those boots, he responded, referring to his ill-fated shoe choice in that catastrophe. I added my own anecdote about investigating the remains of cursed sites when Talia chimed in talking about her staggering stumble into a pool filled with leeches during her first mission. The memories left us feeling connected and light-hearted, providing comic relief against the eerie backdrop. The next day, we ventured deeper into the swampy forest as reports indicated this creature gravitated towards these remote locations. We navigated through thick foliage until we found something bone-chilling, remnants of a previous victim. The body had been maimed beyond recognition. It was a gruesome sight. Following the bloody trail, we came across signs of struggle and claw marks on trees, a testament to the violence that had unfolded in this tranquil part of the Everglades. This is when we noticed a distinct odor permeating the air and heard rustling from the thick brush nearby. As my eyes adjusted, I saw it, a large, hairy, beast-like creature crouching low to the ground. Its feral eyes pierced ours leaving a chilling sensation as if scanning into our souls. It was unlike anything I had ever encountered. The wicked creature's snarl disturbed the stillness in my chest making me second-guess everything I'd known until this point. Without warning, it lunged at Arden, sinking its claws deep into his flesh before tossing him aside like a rag doll. Kieran tried to retaliate but the creature's swift swipe tore through his protective gear leaving him stunned. Talia rushed towards Arden, 
forcing herself to stay focused on her injured comrade. His condition was worsening by each passing second, and she knew he needed prompt attention. Its ruthless attacks had caught us off guard, but there was no time to waste in shock-induced paralysis. As adrenaline surged through my veins, I raised my gun with shaky hands and squared my sights on our enemy. I squeezed the trigger, but it danced away unpredictably, savagely swiping at Kieran once more before disappearing into the dense undergrowth. The beast had vanished as quickly as it emerged, leaving chaos and death in its wake. My heart pounded in my ears as blood pooled around Arden's limp body beneath Talia's care while Kieran lay wheezing with harrowing breaths from his injuries just meters away. In the aftermath of the attack, Talia and I exchanged panicked glances. We knew we had to act fast, or Arden would be lost forever. I yelled as loudly as I could for help, hoping someone would hear us in the woods and come to our rescue. Talia tore a strip of cloth from her shirt and tied it tightly around Arden's wounds, trying to stop the blood that was pooling around him. Slowly, Kieran stood up, clutching his side. His face spoke of unbearable pain, but he didn't voice it. We need to leave now, he said, looking around cautiously. We need to find help. Talia nodded in agreement and helped Arden to his feet. Arden groaned in pain, barely able to move. Despite his condition, we knew that staying in this area would only expose us further to the violent creature. We began a painstakingly slow journey through the dark forest, listening for any indication that the creature was still near. The eerie silence of the night accompanied us as we struggled to keep moving. As we trudged on, I couldn't help but dwell on what I had seen earlier lurking in the undergrowth, the large creature with its blood-stained claws and soul-penetrating eyes. Its menacing presence seemed otherworldly, yet it wasn't anything from myth or folklore I had come across. Our journey came to an abrupt halt when Kieran spotted something lurking in the distance. Could it be? Not wanting us all to potentially fall victim again, Kieran devised a plan based on our limited options. You go for help, Kieran instructed me urgently. Talia and I will stay here with Arden. Keep your phone close so you can find your way back. Reluctantly, but knowing it was the best option for us all at this point, I took off into the dark forest alone. My legs were weak, but the adrenaline kept me moving and my heart pounded loudly in my chest. After what seemed like hours, I stumbled upon a small town on the outskirts of the woods. Gasping for breath, I didn't even waste time trying to find my words but instead showed the somber scene pictures I clicked of our injuries and the surrounding environment. Immediately recognizing our dire situation, some locals agreed to help and grabbed medical supplies. I led them back to where Talia, Kieran, and Arden were waiting. Together with their help, we managed to get Arden and Kieran transported to safety for treatment. It felt like a small miracle that we had made it out alive. The creature haunted us even after our return to civilization. During our recovery period in that small town, the locals inquired about our story who also knew little more than we did about that creature. Perhaps no one knew anything at all. But gruesome tales of a man-beast lurking in the forest spread rapidly among them. When we shared our experience with family and friends back home, most assumed we were embellishing or traumatized by a more earthly animal attack, a bear or perhaps a wild dog. No one believed in something unseen that held a horrifying otherworldly presence. But as time went on, we couldn't shake the memories of our terrifying encounter in the woods that night and began to wonder whether our lives would ever feel normal again. The survival guilt hung just as heavy as our unanswered questions. Who was this beast? Where did it come from? Were there more like it? Though questions lingered among us and rumors flitted around the town, 
no one else seemed to come face to face with this menacing creature again. Or if they did, they certainly hadn't lived to tell their tale. We continued existing both haunted and grateful, relieved that we had lived through the harrowing ordeal but tormented by the scars left on our spirits. For us, life eventually moved forward as it always does, but we could never shake our encounter with the creature in that dark forest. As time passed and we resumed our daily lives, I found myself frequently returning to a frightening thought maybe we hadn't escaped the creature after all. Maybe that night, it didn't simply vanish into the dense undergrowth, maybe it was still out there watching, waiting for its next opportunity to strike. I'm Arnold Strickler working with a special task force, nestled in the heart of a dense forest, somewhere in Oregon. The location, a hidden camp serving as our base of operations, was surrounded by lush greenery and towering ancient trees. Our team specialized in hunting and tracking down monstrous creatures that most people believed didn't exist or belonged only in stories. During one of our secret missions, something felt amidst the forest sounds seemed far more subdued than usual. We were investigating reports of missing persons from nearby settlements. Often cracking jokes to maintain morale among the team members, I'd share tidbits about my youth back in Texas to help them relate to me. Today, as we ventured further towards our target site, our team leader Marlena Pruitt held up her hand and signaled to halt. We gathered in a circle, and she whispered her plan. She told us to split up yes, like in those cliché horror movies, but it was the most logical way of covering a larger area. Marlena went east with Alphonse Bernal, while Jeb Sloten and I were to cover the west quarters with guns at the ready. Nothing could have prepared me for what we encountered as we slowly made our way towards an abandoned cottage deep within the woods. The front door had been violently bashed open, and claw marks decorated the walls inside. From room to room, there were gruesome sights. Bloody handprints trailing across the floor like fingers scraping for survival and discarded clothes shredded beyond recognition. A gut-churning stench filled our nostrils as we navigated in silence. As Jeb checked another room, I found myself at a chilling scene— an improvised dinner table set for two with human remains draped over it like grotesque ornaments, a spine carefully disassembled into vertebrae used for cups while knuckles served as utensils. Suddenly, Jeb whispered through shocked breaths that he'd found a barely conscious man, beaten and bruised, with something lodged in his throat. Before I had time to process what was happening, we heard rustling amidst the trees— Although apprehensive at first, I tried to play it off with a strange smile. Hey, it could be just a lost squirrel, I muttered, attempting to maintain composure. Jeb glanced at me with raised eyebrows but continued towing the injured man. The noises from the woods grew louder and more frenetic. Within seconds, the crashing of brush gave way as a creature lunged towards us. Standing on two legs with leathery skin stretched tight over sinewy muscles, its sickly yellow eyes bore into our souls. This thing neither growled nor snarled. Its silent menace was beyond words. Blinded by fear and adrenaline, we barely managed to exchange fire while dodging away from this monstrous predator whose sole intent was to end our lives. Jeb stayed back to cover us when his gun jammed. Frantically using his last bit of strength to ensure that the man and I reached safety, Jeb hollered for me to run as he desperately wrestled the creature down before finally succumbing to its aggressive attacks. Panicking, I sprinted through the moonlit forest, dragging the battered and barely conscious man behind me. I could still hear Jeb fighting for his life, but I focused on putting as much distance between us and that terrifying creature as possible. My breath came in sharp gasps, 
feeling the weight of the man's body becoming heavier with every step. Neither of us were in any condition to face the abhorrent beast that had made our investigation its hunting grounds. Arriving at our vehicle, I fumbled frantically for the keys in my pocket and unlocked the doors. Please stay with me, I pleaded to the injured man as I placed him in the back seat. The distant sounds of Jeb's struggle tormented me, but there was no time I had to prioritize saving our lives first. I tried calling for help on my phone, but there was no signal amidst these dense woods. Feeling a potent blend of guilt and sorrow for Jeb's loss, I clutched the steering wheel tighter whilst driving towards civilization with haste. With every turn taken, my mind replayed Jeb wrestling that leathery-skinned creature its sinewy muscles flexing beneath taut skin. It's hauntingly yellow, silent eyes burned into my memory as a stark reminder of just how vulnerable we were in this merciless world. Upon reaching the nearby town's hospital, doctors and nurses immediately tended to him while I contacted local police. When they arrived and questioned me about what took place in that dilapidated house, it was evident that none of them believed my account about any otherworldly creature. They did, however, take note of Jeb's disappearance when inspecting the gruesome scene with a search party. Finding evidence only of our fired weapons and Jeb's broken flashlight gave rise to conspiracies regarding his whereabouts. Three harrowing days passed before authorities found Jeb's mutilated remains. The heart-wrenching reality of his loss struck me, and I wondered if things would have been different if we had realized the gravity of the situation earlier. While visiting the grieving family in their mourning period, I recognized the undeniable truth. Jeb died putting his life on the line to ensure that the injured man and I made it to safety. Though we could never truly understand what we had faced in those woods, Jeb would always be remembered as a true hero. That creature has disappeared to an unknown location, leaving only chilling memories and questions too terrifying to ask. I thank Jeb's family for sharing their strength during this unimaginable loss, while my resolve pushed me to find help for those it tormented. Though I didn't know much about folklore or paranormal phenomena, I swore to research this creature to protect others from falling prey to its malice vowing never again to let anyone face this horror alone. So began my search for knowledge to comprehend and hopefully put an end to this monstrous being's ominous existence, fueled by a need not only for justice but also for redemption. Whether or not theories formed were met with skepticism, my goal remained true, uncovering the secrets behind this enigmatic entity before more lives were tragically lost. And so, with the fallen beside me in spirit, I ventured forth into a daunting world of darkness and unexplained mysteries. I, Jasper Smalding, was exhausted after a long day at the office. The small city of Little Root, nestled deep in Redwood National Park, had become a hotbed for unusual incidents lately ever since I joined Task Force Valkyrie. We specialize in hunting and tracking monsters, but nothing could have prepared me for what was about to unfold. My partner Alice River and I were called to investigate a peculiar case involving a sudden increase of disappearances in the surrounding forest area. The sheriff informed us that in the past six months, over a dozen people had gone missing without a trace. It appeared as if they had simply vanished into thin air. We started by interviewing friends and relatives of the victims, trying to find any common link or anything at all that could provide us a clue. It began as any typical investigation would. We searched for patterns and discussed potential theories around town, but something stood out throughout our work there was an eerie sense that we were being watched. It started with subtle signs, an unexpected creak from an old floorboard, a rustle of leaves just beyond our view, arresting our attention. 
As mundane as the sensation felt at first, it gradually increased over time. Our encounters with this stalking presence intensified consistently in line with the progress we were making on our case. One day, while examining tracks near one of the missing persons' homes, we discovered something unusual, large footprints inconsistent with anything known to be native to the area. Alice pulled out her camera to take pictures while I measured the size of these mysterious tracks. The prints were slightly different from each other but shared similar characteristics. Elongated toes and elongated foot pads tapered towards the heel like that of no creature we'd encountered before in our careers. A few days later, after many jumbled thoughts and sleepless hours spent researching possible explanations for these strange markings, we stumbled upon a centuries-old folktale passed down through generations. This local legend told of a creature that would appear in times of strife, stealing away people to satisfy its desire to consume and terrify. The lore, however vague and uncertain, seemed the only plausible explanation for our predicament. From this point forward, we iterated on the only plan available to us, track and confront the beast. Its presence was terrifyingly relentless, and flaming a deepening terror within us as its determination intensified. In following the creature's tracks, we found ourselves approaching a section of the forest notorious for its highly disorienting fog. At first, it seemed innocuous, beautiful even in its commitment to shroud the landscape with an otherworldly veil. But before long, the true nature of this fog became known. It was thick and suffocating like heavy smoke and altered our perceptions in an almost intoxicating way. We can't waste. My voice trailed off as Alice stumbled over something hidden beneath the dense foliage. We decelerated as our vision blurred like wax paper smeared with oil. Our senses failed. Within seconds the oppressive vapor retreated to reveal an unimaginable horror. The twisted form of the beast emerged from its veil mere meters from us, imposing itself between us and our escape. Without thinking, I tried reaching for my radio to call for backup but quickly remembered that our devices were losing signal deeper we ventured into these woods. In this moment, clarity hit me like a gunshot. We were alone at the mercy of this monster. The creature was enormous, at least nine feet tall with sinewy limbs covered in mottled skin that almost resembled ancient tree bark. Its head adorned with tangled knots and haphazard horns upon which heavy chains hung entwined scraping audibly against the skin below. It's come for us! Alice's shout rang into my ears as she struggled to draw her gun. We can't let it take us, Alice! I grabbed Alice's arm, and we bolted in the opposite direction of the creature, keeping our weapons drawn. The fog had dispersed enough for us to navigate through the forest, but not enough to feel entirely safe. My mind raced with questions. What was this creature? How did it come to exist? More urgently, how could we escape and survive? I knew relatively nothing about folklore creatures, only having heard some stories as a child that I'd dismissed long ago. As we hurried through the trees... Alice looked frantically around for any trace of a trail or landmark. There has to be a way out of here, she panted. We could try climbing a tree and calling for help, I suggested. No, it's too risky. We don't know if this thing can climb, she replied as we continued running. Suddenly, the creature slammed onto the ground right in front of us causing us to skid to a halt. Alice aimed her gun at the creature's head and fired. The bullet hit its mark but seemed to have little impact it roared and charged at us again. We narrowly dodged its attack and kept running deeper into the forest. The chase wore on for what felt like hours when we finally stumbled out of the woods onto a dirt road. Out of breath, I tried my radio again and this time there was a faint response from our team. Help! 
We're being chased by something. I screamed into the radio as we continued running down the road. As if on cue, the creature emerged from the trees behind us, bearing down on us in full force. But in its haste to catch us, it made a grave mistake. It followed us too far out of its foggy domain. The sun was low in the sky now, but still strong enough to start burning and searing its mottled skin. The creature screeched in pain as it veered off the road into nearby shrubs. It stared at us, breathing heavily, as smoke fumes bellowed off its now blistering and smoking flesh. The sun was having a toxic reaction on the creature, making it weak and unable to follow us any longer. As we looked at it with mixed relief and curiosity, I glimpsed something I hadn't seen before. A chain wrapped around one of its horns had a small metal tag attached to it, similar to a dog collar. Etched on the tag were three simple words, Government Biological Experiment. It hit me then and there that this creature might not be mythical after all. It was an abomination created by the human drive for power a twisted combination of man's arrogance and the ancient forest fury. Realizing we had the upper hand for now, Alice and I cautiously backed away from the creature as it wallowed in agony. When we were far enough away, we bolted down the road until our backup arrived. In my report later, I described the creature thoroughly, including its unusual tag. An investigation was launched into possible illegal government projects deep in the heart of these woods but found no solid leads. The creature's origin remains unknown. Some say it's a mutated local predator that got out of control. Others suspect darker conspiracies involving top-secret genetic research. Personally, I tend not to dwell on its specifics. What truly terrifies me is knowing that beyond our understanding lies an inexhaustible source of horrors waiting to be unleashed upon our world. With every bizarre case like this that comes across my desk, I can't help but think about my lost partner, Alice. Whether she died from injuries sustained during our encounter with that terrible creature or from some other mysterious cause during those final days is a question only she can answer. But every time I walk by her now empty desk or see her name on the roster, I'm reminded of the one lesson this near-death experience taught me. The more we strain against the limits of our knowledge, the more perilous our world becomes. I wasn't too far from Tahoe National Forest when I heard the faint cries for help. My name is Jameson Beaumont, and I work for a task force that specializes in hunting and tracking monsters. Our mission had brought us to chase down an unknown creature responsible for a series of gruesome incidents. As a child, I lost my sister to a mysterious beast that terrorized our community. That set me on this path and bonded me with my teammates who had experienced similar tragedies. We didn't choose this life. It chose us. There were three of us, myself, Ophelia Wainwright, and Xavier Dunn. Together we formed the backbone of Task Force 31, known for getting the job done no matter the cost. Our footsteps crunched against gravel as we walked deeper into the forest in pursuit of the unknown assailant. The location was perfect for our mission, heavily wooded terrain that limited visibility and provided ample cover for ambushes. The diminished sunlight filtering through the canopy created eerie shadows, forming twisted shapes on the ground. Each whispering breeze sent goosebumps racing down my spine and I clutched my gun tighter as we followed the cries for help. In your four o'clock, Ophelia whispered as she spotted movement. The situation intensified, our pulse quickening as anticipation built. We found a survivor, clinging on to life, his shirt stained with blood from multiple deep gashes across his chest. His breaths were shallow and panicked, 
fear evident in his eyes. He recounted how he and other hikers were attacked by something vicious and fast-moving, a blur among the trees that killed swiftly before vanishing like smoke in the wind. As we pressed further, Zav found evidence of a struggle, broken branches and scattered belongings suggesting an ambush had taken place nearby. There was no time to lose. We had to find our target before it took more lives. The quieter we attempted to be, the closer danger seemed. We could feel it closing in around us, yet it remained elusive. The forest was playing tricks on our minds, amplifying every rustle and crack. I could sense my teammates gritting their teeth, trying to remain focused on the task at hand. Suddenly, a growl echoed through the trees, a guttural, animalistic sound that sent chills down our spines. Adrenaline kicked in and we barged through the foliage, following this terrifying sound. We stumbled upon a clearing, where an enormous creature mauled a helpless victim with unfathomable violence. The beast was unlike anything we had witnessed before, muscular and tall covered in sinewy hair as black as tar. Its snarling face revealed rows of teeth designed for ripping flesh from bone. As we got ready to engage the monster, it suddenly locked eyes with us and charged at incredible speed. With guns raised, we fired round after round into the oncoming beast, yet it barely flinched. It quickly closed the distance between us and began swinging its claws with terrifying accuracy. We scattered and moved around, attempting to confuse the creature by attacking from different angles. Ophelia's battle cry rang out as she fearlessly slashed at its legs with her knife. I saw Xavier struggling with the monster alone. It effortlessly slammed him against a tree. Any semblance of humor that usually accompanied our interactions was gone now, replaced by desperate determination as our lives hung in balance. Realizing that more firepower was needed to put an end to this massacre, or at least slow down the creature long enough for us to escape, I sprinted back towards our base camp to retrieve heavier artillery. Darting past the trees, I finally reached our base camp, frantically searching for the shotgun we brought for emergencies. Help me now! I shouted towards the sky, hoping against hope that a higher power would intervene. My hands fumbled around, finally finding the shotgun and gathering the necessary ammunition. Sweat dripped down my face while sprinting back to the battlefield. The growls and screams intensified as I approached, filled with urgency and terror. I'm coming! I yelled, desperate to offer some hope to my teammates. On returning to the clearing, I found Ophelia bruised and battered but still fighting with relentless fervor. Xavier lay unconscious beside her, bloodied by the creature's assault. The creature continued its rampage, targeting Ophelia now. Before it could strike her down, I aimed the shotgun at its massive body and fired several rounds. Boom! 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 The beast staggered back but remained standing despite our best efforts. Ophelia, we need to go now! I shouted as she threw herself towards me in desperation. Leaving Xavier's lifeless body behind was a painful choice that we had to make to save our own lives. We stumbled desperately into the dense forest, driven by adrenaline and terror. Moments later, distant sirens wailed through the woods, an unexpected but much-needed rescue force arrived. Perhaps someone had heard our shots and called for help, or maybe it was just luck on our side. As we continued to rush away from the creature, a helicopter appeared above us with a spotlight illuminating our path forward. A voice rang through a megaphone from above. This is first response support. We're here to help. We didn't have time for full explanations. We needed their firepower. Attack, the beast. I managed to stammer through my exhaustion between gasps of air. The helicopter quickly changed course, 
flying towards the scene of the earlier carnage. Gunfire echoed in the forest as we found cover under the trees, praying that our rescuers would succeed where we failed. We broke into tears when we heard the gunfire cease. Our worst fear came true. Xavier did not make it. His bravery would forever be etched in our memories. It took several days for authorities to investigate the creature and its origins. Mangled corpses were discovered in nearby areas, and it became apparent that this wasn't its first encounter with unsuspecting victims. Wildlife experts studied the remains of the slain creature meticulously. Finally, a conclusion was drawn. The monstrous beast was likely a mutated aberration of once-endangered species that had grown more aggressive due to harmful changes in their environment. News of Xavier's heroic sacrifice spread among our unit and all who knew him. Inexplicable grief weighed us down while understanding that our lives were spared, thanks largely to his bravery. Life moved on for Ophelia and me, haunted by what we went through but determined to face the world after such a harrowing experience. We never looked at life quite the same way again, knowing how unpredictable and terrifying it could be. As time passed, we accepted our reality, an unknown friend taken too soon, memories etched with pain and grief, and unanswered questions about how such a disturbing event could happen. It was a reminder of how frail life can be and how grave dangers could lurk around any corner. We learned to honor Xavier's life by carrying his courage within us, appreciating every moment we had left in this world. We would always remember him as he was, a brave teammate who met his tragic end by standing up against an unimaginable horror. It was a gruesome ordeal that challenged our understanding of existence. Experiences like these stay with you long after they're over, shaping who you become. My name is Ezekiel Morgenstern, and I stood at the edge of Aokigahara Forest, Japan. The moon cast silver on the dense woodland and somewhere within this green labyrinth lurked a creature that tonight I would face. My team from a covert task force specialized in hunting monsters like these accompanied me. Our radio operator, Isidora Frankelstein, was the one to let us in on this particular mission. She spoke of an alarming number of missing persons in the area. When bodies were found, they bore signs of savage mauling, making them barely recognizable. We started our pursuit slowly and carefully into the forest. I shared stories about my days as a struggling artist just to ease the tension. Remember when I used my paintings as coasters? I said to Philemon Bordeaux beside me. He chuckled softly and nodded, his eyes scanning for any movement. Unexpectedly, Rosila Wainwright discovered a trail that led us straight to our ungodly quarry's feeding ground, an unnerving scene with splashes of red painted all over trees and earth. It resembled a demented den hosting gory exhibits. Weapons on guard, we stalked deeper into the woods where we could hear distant cries. Philemon tripped on something fleshy. It was a severed arm still wearing the wedding band it once took pride in. Damn it! cursed Harmony Doherty as she kicked at the ground in frustration. Why isn't there any backup? I reminded her that we couldn't risk exposing our existence to outsiders. Calling for help would attract unwanted attention from local authorities. We followed the cries through thick foliage, everyone focused and alert. Suddenly, we came face to face with our monstrous adversary a behemoth covered in coarse hair and sharp scales that glinted like steel points under the moonlight. It stood on muscular limbs, claws extended menacingly. Mesmerized by the creature's unblinking eyes, the size of saucers and cunning in their obsidian depths, I couldn't help but strike a comparison with H.P. Lovecraft's cosmic horrors. 
With unmatched speed, the creature dashed at us, the force from its movement capable of appending trees. I shouted for my squad to break formation. Our guns roared in defiance, their bullets seemingly absorbed into its thick hide. Outmatched physically and relying on our wits alone, we retreated into a makeshift formation. Isidora hacked at its limbs with her knife while Rosilla fired her rifle, a brutal dance between beast and human. Destruction reigned, screams living alongside the crackle of dying trees as we continued fighting this abomination. Injured and desperate as blood seeped through our makeshift bandages, we sought to contain it for now. What do you think its name is? quipped Philemon in a weak attempt at humor as we stumbled towards our next strategic point. I needed to answer Philemon. I don't care what its name is, just focus on how we can stop it. I shouted back. He gave a resigned nod and continued loading his rifle. We all knew that calling for backup was out of the question. Our existence and mission were top secret. Taking a deep breath, I tried to think of any possible way we could defeat this creature without losing more lives. Rosilla had been severely injured, and Isidora seemed to be running on fumes after attacking the creature relentlessly with her knife. Philemon suddenly disrupted my thoughts with an idea. What if we set up a trap? We could lure it in and then trigger an explosion. I glanced around at my remaining teammates, bloodied but determined. This plan may work at containing the creature long enough for us to escape, or at least buy time for reinforcements to arrive. We knew they would eventually realize we were overdue for check-in. Nodding approval, I delegated tasks quickly. Rosilla, I need you and Isidora to find anything flammable. Gasoline. Maybe some torn clothing drenched in it as a fuse. Rosilla, supporting her injured leg with a makeshift crutch, winced but acknowledged the order. Isidora gave her a reassuring pat on the back. Philemon, help me find a suitable location, enclosed but not too small, something that can contain the blast. With everything falling into place for our desperate plan, we got to work. Time was of the essence if we hoped to put an end to this horrifying encounter. After setting up the trap near an old shack surrounded by thick woods, we positioned ourselves strategically around it and tried our best to attract our monstrous enemy, firing shots into the air and making as much noise as possible. As if on cue, a guttural roar sounded through the trees, and our abomination came crashing through the foliage nearby. It was bigger, more fearsome than I had remembered. Its piercing eyes locked on us one by one, assessing its prey. Trepidation filled the air as the creature hesitated just out of reach from our trap. It seemed more intelligent than we initially thought, almost as if it sensed that something was off. Time seemed to stand still as we willed for it to continue forward. A sudden gunshot rang out from Rosilla's direction, the bullet glancing off the creature and forcing it to step forward into the trap. Reacting quickly, Philemon and I triggered the explosion. The ground shook violently as fire engulfed the area where the beast had stood moments before. We felt a mixture of relief and shock at what we had just accomplished even though we couldn't be sure if we truly defeated it. We decided not to take any chances and retreated back toward our initial rendezvous point. As we moved with haste, straining against our injuries and fatigue, I glanced back just once to catch a glimpse of the smoke billowing from the tree line. Once we reached a safe distance, I finally allowed myself to call for extraction on our encrypted communication device. It was time to bring this mission to an end, regardless of potential exposure risk. Back at base, debriefed and treated for injuries, we could only speculate what that creature might have been. A rogue genetic experiment by an enemy agency? A prehistoric surviving species rediscovered in a remote region? 
or perhaps something else entirely? No concrete answers would be found. All traces of the incident were meticulously erased by our superiors. The secrecy surrounding our mission held steadfast. No outsiders ever learning what took place in those bleak hours. As days turned into weeks, one unsettling question lingered with me. Was that monstrous foe truly gone or simply lying in wait for its next prey? Despite the haunting uncertainty, we had survived together, each carrying the weight of those who had fallen. We remembered them with heavy hearts, their lasting legacies urging us to become stronger. It was this lesson we carried moving forward, united as a team faced with the unknown dangers that continuously lurked in the shadows. My name is Ezekiel Higgins, and I found myself deep in the heart of the Pine Barrens, New Jersey. As a member of a task force dedicated to hunting and tracking monsters, my life was far from ordinary. I inhaled the cool air, enjoying the earthy smell that it carried. The Pine Barrens span about 1.1 million acres, punctuated with dense forests, boggy swamps, and sandy soil that crunched underfoot as I followed the secret missions trail. Though a beautiful place to explore during daytime, these woods took on an eerie glow at night. I glanced at my partner on this mission. No signal here. Cassandra muttered, frustrated by her phone's unsuccessful attempt at finding a connection. It would be better to just shout for help. I couldn't help but agree with her deadpan humor. You remember that time on our trip to Yellowstone? In addition to my monster hunting career, I had genuinely shared some lighter moments with Cassandra, moments which made her relatable and often eased the tension when we were out on perilous missions. A gruesome scene interrupted our reminiscence. We stumbled upon what was left of Jeremy, missing since last week, and couldn't help but cringe at his charred remains. It seemed as if he had been consumed by fire from within. We hadn't seen anything like this before. As the days went by, we discovered more victims in similar conditions, burned beyond recognition and left to rot in the woods. The killings evolved our mission further. We had to find out who, or what, committed these horrific crimes. During our investigations, we would find peculiar footprints filled with rainwater, the prints were massive and beastly, but matched no known creature's anatomy. I've never seen tracks like these before, I said to Cassandra as she nervously chewed her pen's cap with furrowed brows. Our task force couldn't ignore the evidence any longer. Seeking assistance, we contacted an expert from the local university, Dr. Benedict Shepard, a man with an extensive background in zoology surveyed the tracks and victims with excited curiosity. Well, Dr. Shepard began, his voice measured and somber as he analyzed the site. These footprints undoubtedly belong to an unknown animalistic creature. As the days turned into weeks, we tracked the beast through miles of dense forest and moonlit swamps. The menacing quietness of our surroundings struck on a primal level and I found myself fighting an urge to vanish between trees or dive below swamp water to escape pursuit. It was then that our first contact with this creature happened. As we arrived at a derelict old cabin deep in the woods, it turned toward us, its eyes shining like reflective pools in the darkness. The villain had matted fur, sharp claws bigger than kitchen knives, and a broad silhouette that trembled with pent-up aggression. My heart raced as adrenaline surged through my veins. I finally understood fear at its core. This was no monster from a work of fiction, no werewolf or vampire, that could be stopped by any human weapon or ritual. It was raw animal instinct crafted into something horrifyingly perfect, an apex predator unknown to modern science. 
We held our breaths as this monstrous being circled us. I could feel a searing white-hot pain as it pierced through my shoulder with its razor-sharp claws. Cassandra quickly fired her gun at it, prompting it to retreat for a moment, only for it to launch forward once more with relentless hunger and rage evident in its movements. The creature roared savagely before diving back into the shadows. We realized that this menacing antagonist was not retreating but preparing its next cruel move on us or other innocents who had unknowingly wandered into its territory. We were running out of time, and our anxiety started to consume us. As the sun started to disappear behind the trees, we braced ourselves for another harrowing night hunting this elusive creature. Our desperate hope that the night would be the last one spent in fear continued to wane as we once again ventured into the sinister woods. Continuing our treacherous journey through the dark woods, we realized that we were deep in the territory of an unknown creature. Cassandra and I had no choice but to push forward, as the path behind us proved to be even more dangerous. We found ourselves navigating through a minefield of hidden pitfalls, our breaths coming in shallow, short gasps as we struggled to keep our bearings. The gnarling trees whispered eerie secrets and taunted us with warnings of impending doom. The forest itself almost seemed to cooperate with the monstrous being that hunted us. Dodging another shadowy attack from the creature's sharp claws, I couldn't help but notice the quickness of its movements, darting in and out as if it possessed some level of intelligence surpassing the average wild animal. More so, it seemed hell-bent on tormenting us instead of making a decisive killing blow. As we stumbled upon a clearing in the forest, the creature momentarily retreated into the darkness. Knowing our reprieve would be brief at best, we decided to split up and search for help. Cassandra would head for a nearby town with whatever speed her exhausted legs could muster while I stayed behind and fashioned makeshift weapons out of tree branches. The creature observed intently from the shadows as I desperately crafted crude tools. Seizing an opportunity during a fleeting moment when my guard was down, it lunged at me while letting out a gut-wrenching screech that defied its massive frame. Before I could defend myself, it grabbed my ankle and flung me across the clearing like a ragdoll. Seconds before losing consciousness, I noticed two figures approaching, park rangers who had been alerted by Cassandra's desperate pleas for help and must have been following her tracks. One swiftly attempted to intervene, pulling his sidearm while his companion tended to me. Through blurry vision and incomprehensible pain, I hazily saw an intense combat unfold. The park ranger managed to lodge a few rounds into the creature's thick hide and momentarily startled it. However, it quickly regained composure, retaliating with brute force and overpowering him in the process. Within moments, the creature crushed the park ranger by bringing its gargantuan claw down with enough force to shatter his ribcage. I could only watch helplessly as blood pooled around his lifeless remains, an outraging reminder of mankind's futile attempt to control the unknown depths of nature. The other ranger, after tending to my battered body, fired a flare gun into the sky. Panicked and disoriented, the creature retreated deeper into the forest. As if the flare had sent it an unyielding message of humanity's resilience, we could no longer hear its frightening howls in response. With every thud, hum, and whisper around us, the park ranger cautiously guided me back through the forest. My blood-soaked clothes stuck to my skin as my body reeked with sweat and fear. The image of that poor ranger laying lifeless in a pool of his own blood continued to plague my thoughts. As we finally emerged from the forest with our lives intact, albeit barely so, I found myself haunted by my encounter with that grotesque creature. It defied logic and known science, leaving behind only searing scars on my shoulder and unfathomable memories burned within my mind. 
I could only surmise that this enigmatic beast was a previously undiscovered species, one that had avoided human detection for years and now bore witness to our intrusion into its home. A living horror tale that defied imagination, a testament to nature's mysteries lurking beneath societal progress. Though we survived that harrowing encounter, there would always be an unspoken reminder of what was left behind, the life of an unyielding park ranger making his stand against overwhelming odds, a valiant sacrifice against an enemy he couldn't have possibly understood. His memory serves as a solemn reminder for those venturing into the unknown that there lurks something monstrous in even the darkest corners of our world. While my physical wounds will eventually heal, the residual terror from that gruesome attack will haunt me for the rest of my days, a grisly shadow forever cast upon my soul. I scratched my beard as I eyed the dense forest surrounding Camp Custer National Park. My name is Tobias Forrester, and my life has been dedicated to hunting and tracking down monsters as part of an elite task force. Yet nothing could prepare me for the mission that would unfold today. Arriving at the location, my team was a mix of skilled individuals with specialties ranging from demolitions to forensics. We gathered around the briefing table. An expert walked us through a series of disappearances and gruesome murders that had taken place here over recent weeks. In our line of work, tragedy was no stranger, but the details were uniquely horrifying, crimson spatters across trees, limbs twisted in unnatural ways, and steaming entrails draping across branches like morbid tinsel. Arnold Clavering, our demolitions expert, shifted in his seat. So, what do we know about our Monster of the Week? At that moment, I received a call from my wife that I hesitated but finally decided to take. Sweetie, I whispered into the phone. I'll call you back later. I love you. As much as I longed for her support, time was not on our side. Whatever this thing is, stated Catherine Elford, our forensic analyst. It's strong enough to dismantle its victims like a child playing with dolls. Let's get these woods cleaned up then, said Arnold smirkingly. Our exploration led us deep into the forest's heart when we came across a fresh scene, the aftermath of another gruesome attack. The scent of death hung heavy in the air as we inventoried missing persons from a nearby campsite. We set up camp ourselves and took turns on watch. During my shift, Arnold shared feeling uneasy about his long absences from his daughters, an itch that time would only exacerbate despite doing our best to balance work and family priorities. Morning broke with crimson tendrils creeping over the horizon and touches of sunshine on my weary eyes. We found fresh tracks. It wasn't long until we stumbled upon a gnarled tree, standing out amongst its serene, verdant neighbors. The bark, twisted and scarred, marked the hiding place for our cryptic adversary. My heart raced as we peeled back layers of splintering wood, revealing a grotesque monstrosity emerging from hibernation. Eyes as red as blood glared down at us with malevolent intent, its elongated limbs snapping like whips. Arnold's instinct to throw his charge fizzled in his fingers our foe unfazed by the initial blast. It's not working! I shouted amidst panic and gunfire. Our retreat carved a frenzied path through the burning foliage. Gravel tore at our heels as we desperately searched for an advantage within this battle unfolding around us. My breath caught as I spied massive talons wrapping around a still body, Catherine's, no longer fighting for survival. Echoes of her eerie screams rang in my ears like mocking laughter. Tobias, we need to regroup! Arnold yelled through clenched teeth, panic sweeping through the air like poisonous fumes. 
Our watches continued in vigilance tinged with grief and growing exhaustion, one eye on the malevolent force stalking us like prey, the other down at our feet to avoid a twig snap or crunching leaves that could reveal our position. The labyrinthine forest gnashed at our resolve, yet we had no choice but to press forward, the room for error now slimmer than a razor's edge. We have to lead it out of here, I suggested hoarsely, hands shaking from caffeine and adrenaline running through my veins. Arnold nodded grimly in agreement before adding, Let's give this beast the fight of its life. Stealing ourselves for the coming battle, we laid a careful plan based on Arnold's calculations and prepared to face the beast head-on. As daylight dwindled, the creature lashed out once more. We sprang into action, every leap, roll, and tackle executed with militaristic precision. Its eyes glinted like embers amongst the shadows as it stalked towards us, a smug sneer curling around enormous fangs. Desperate to survive, Arnold and I split up. The creature's attention veered towards me, the bloodlust in its eyes horrifically apparent. My heart pounded as I darted through the forest. Thoughts of calling for help raced through my mind but with the creature so close, every second counted and pausing would only make me an easier target. The forest floor grew slick with blood and gore from what remained of Catherine's body. The creature was relentless, snapping at my heels with its powerful jaws. My plan, though rudimentary at best, was to keep running until the monster tired itself out and gave up. Arnold would be waiting in a prearranged location, ready to execute the next phase of our plan, trap the beast in a carefully laid pit concealed amidst foliage. Stay true to the course. I thought as my feet pounded against the ground. Zigzagging deeper into the labyrinth and thicket, I was nearly convinced that I had heard footsteps behind me falter when my phone rang unexpectedly. It was Arnold. But it was too dangerous to answer. Surely he realized this. There was no option other than to let it go to voicemail. Panting heavily, I spotted Arnold in our agreed meeting spot and noticed that he had already baited the trap with fresh meat. Quick! We don't have much time! shouted Arnold. Adrenaline consumed me as we both sprinted towards a makeshift shelter built from fallen branches. As we did so, Arnold shared his eavesdropping discovery. Tobias! The creature can't stand high-pitched noises and that's why it temporarily retracted from our phone's ringing. Our secret weapon now primed, we waited for its approach. Crunching through foliage and cracking limbs underfoot signaled its proximity. Arnold gripped my arm. Ready, now! In unison, we activated our phone's emergency siren apps and unleashed an ear-piercing cacophony to the beast. The creature screeched in agony staggering towards the bait and into the ambush. As he plummeted into the pit, a triumphant Arnold and I remained hidden, careful to wait a respectable amount of time before deeming our plan a success. Hours passed. The creature's shrieks and pain thrashing gradually ceased as it finally succumbed to the immense damage inflicted by our trap. Within the silence that filled the air, we knew it was time to assess this foreign beast before us. Arsenal in hand, we approached cautiously, examining its gargantuan, muscular form, long fangs protruding from its maw, a grotesque face covered in black fur disrupted only by those shocking red eyes now staring lifelessly upwards. As we began documenting this seemingly new species with photographs and notes, Arnold suggested we name it. The crimson gaze, I suggested grimly, to exemplify its most striking feature and commemorate Catherine. Arnold nodded in agreement. We meticulously sealed off the pit using fallen logs before heading back to civilization. Although depleted resources in our bones screamed for a shower and bed, we still journeyed towards the nearest ranger station. First things first, 
reporting what had transpired during our horrific ordeal. Describing events without voicing suspicions of paranormal origins, lest we sounded insane, we still felt blindsided by what had occurred. Both Arnold and I, confirmation seekers no more, accepted this mystery would likely remain unexplained as scientists would undoubtedly classify it as an unknown predator hunting Catherine, Arnold, and me as twist of fate. Once reports were officially filed away within local law enforcement archives, we went back to normal life, or tried to at least. Nightmares of crimson orbs suspended in darkness haunted me for weeks on end as waves of grief for Catherine washed over my soul. Months later, Arnold and I unveiled a monument among the trees we aptly named Catherine's Grove. The crimson gaze had changed our lives forever, but Catherine, our fallen comrade still filled with potential, motivated us to remember and reminisce her essence now and in years to come. I'm Miles, a specialist in the CATS task force, known for hunting and tracking monsters. Currently, I find myself in the dense woods of Oregon, where untold mysteries lurk in the shadows. My assignment... Locate a creature responsible for numerous missing persons and grisly murders. Growing up in a broken home and experiencing countless hardships, it's no wonder I found solace in fighting monsters. My life is a battle against my demons and the creatures I pursue. In these woods, my team and I have observed an eerie silence. An unnerving calm filled the air even birds ceased their usual singing. We tread carefully, our senses heightened. My fellow agent Janice McDowell breaks the silence. What kind of monster do you think we're dealing with this time? Chuckling nervously, I reply. Hopefully one that doesn't hold grudges. We continue through the woods until discovering peculiar tracks leading deeper into the forest. Following them, we cross a small creek and start to notice the suffocating smell of decay. Agent Tim Conrad begins to gag. This isn't right, he whispers. Everyone else acknowledges with an uneasy nod as we push forward. Shortly after, we stumble upon what seems to be an abandoned clearing littered with human remains the missing persons or remnants of past meals for whatever hunted these woods. It happens suddenly the creature strikes from above. In an instant, Mark Riley is snatched away. Panic ensues as we collectively brace for imminent danger. The creature is incredibly fast and camouflaged within thick foliage overhead. All we see are glimpses so quick we cannot fully comprehend its form with precision. Like us, this monster has been waiting for the perfect moment to strike. It reveals itself partially before vanishing like smoke blending back into the leaves above. Its agile body is a fusion of fur and flesh. It has dark beady eyes fueled by insatiable hunger, jagged serrated teeth, and talons so sharp they could slice through bone like butter. We fan out, guns drawn and eyes scanning the foliage. My hands tremble, sweat pouring down my face. Tim murmurs a prayer under his breath while Janice checks her weapon. We know that regardless of its appearance or motivation, it must be stopped. It doesn't take long for the creature to strike again. This time, an unseen force maims Tim without warning, a blood-curdling scream ricocheting in our ears. Exiting the forest suddenly seems near impossible. Our navigation systems are malfunctioning. Each path we took led to another gruesome scene as though we were being deliberately led to them. The air shifts, thick with tension and the feeling we have become prey. No time to call for backup Mark is missing and Tim beyond help. Janice and I resolve to locate the creature's lair before it claims more victims or drags us into its twisted depths. We theorize it's hurting us in this sadistic game. 
It has unexpectedly become a fight for survival against a relentless force driven by pure instinct. Kill or be killed. As we delve deeper into its perverse world, we realize we haven't heard from Mark since his abduction. Is he still alive or just another macabre reminder of our impending fate? Making calculated and compassionate decisions is critical in times of crisis. But how can we contend with an unknown beast preying on our vulnerability? Janice suddenly hears distant pleas from Mark's direction. She dashes ahead, disappearing into the shadows toward his frantic voice. Fear grips me as I remain cautious while catching up with her. Now alone and disoriented amid the grotesque scene of devastation left by this creature, dread consumes me wholly. My thoughts race back to Mark's desperate cries as I turn another corner following Janice's trail. But she's gone. Jump skirt into oblivion, with nothing left but the echoes of her own hasty footsteps. I'm the last one standing the only one left to confront our nightmares. Suddenly, I see it, the creature emerging from the shadows, riled up by the scent of blood and fear. Its form looms perilously close, lethal intent clear as its beady eyes pierce my soul. With no time to waste, I sprint in the direction Janice vanished. The creature's grotesque appearance shocks me, covered in scales and patches of thick fur, twisted limbs, and razor-sharp claws. It moves with an agility that defies its monstrous size. Despite feeling fear, I cannot allow it to take Janice as well. As I approach, I notice an old warehouse with its door wide open, an omen of unspeakable horrors waiting inside. Knowing that Janice and Mark might be trapped within its walls leaves me no choice but to follow them. I'm not a detective or a hunter but any moment of doubt could mean death for us all. Calling for help is too risky. The creature could be alerted to my presence. Entering the warehouse, I keep my ears open for any signs indicating where they are. Mark's distant cries lead me in their direction. My heart pounds in my chest as I move quietly through the darkness. In the far corner of the warehouse, a horrifying scene unfolds. The creature has tied Janice and Mark up with ropes constructed from human hair it must have collected from its victims. Blood stains around them signal their dire state. I creep closer, looking for any kind of weapon to defend myself against the beast. A rusty pipe lying nearby catches my eye. With no other option available, I grab it and try to formulate a plan to save my friends and escape alive. Before I can act, the creature senses my presence. It whirls around with a guttural growl, its mouth full of sharp teeth bared menacingly at me. I step back slowly, gripping the pipe tightly as sweat trickles down my face. Struggling to hold my focus and suppress my fear, time grinds to a slow crawl as I remember what led us here. The need for survival takes over. There's no other choice left but to forge my own path through the monster's lair. Armed with the pipe, I strike the creature and it roars in pain, momentarily distracted. I race to Janice and Mark, doing my best to untie them. Trembling hands impede my speed, but I eventually manage to free them. Together, bruised and battered three of us try to make our escape. The creature, however has not been defeated and chases after us, a growl rising from its throat. The air is thick with fear as we bolt through the dark warehouse, a predator stalking its prey. Nearing the exit, Janice makes a daring decision. She picks up a metal beam from the rubble and instructs me to take Mark outside while she holds the creature at bay. Her eyes hold determination as she swings at the beast with all her might. Reluctantly leaving Janice behind, Mark and I stumble out into the night air shocked by what we just experienced. We know someone else should be alerted about this situation. Our survival depends on it. Managing to reach a neighbor's house despite our injuries, 
we frantically explain everything that occurred. The disbelief in their eyes gives way to concern when they see our bloody state. Dialing 911, help arrives within minutes, but every second spent waiting feels like an eternity. The police storm into the warehouse armed with weapons while paramedics tend to our wounds. We hear gunshots followed by unnatural screams from inside. Finally, it goes quiet. As officers emerge from the warehouse, they inform us that they've killed an unknown being that seemed part human, part animal. They also found Janice hiding beneath piles of rubble, bruised but alive. In the aftermath of this horrifying incident, we can't help but mourn those victims whose lives were snuffed out by this monstrous creature lurking in darkness. But we also find solace in being alive forever bound by the horrors we face together. While a part of us shattered that day, there's also a part that emerged stronger than ever. From now on, Every step we take in life shall be in memoriam of those dragged below by the terrors lurking within the shadows. As survivors, it's our duty to carry on with the light of their memories guiding our way to a brighter future. I'm Frank, soaked to the bone standing in the pouring rain in the dense forest of Byloiza, Poland. Shivering, I rub my hands together and curse myself for choosing this profession. The job seemed enticing a few years back when we set up this specialized task force to hunt monsters and protect people. Little did I know that it would come with such insanity. My partner, Katarzyna, radios in our progress. Frank Grzegorczyk and Katarzyna Sokolowski reporting. No signs of the creature yet. Our communication is crisp and to the point. Roger that, replies our commander over the static-laced radio waves, and we continue our search. The forest is dense with ancient oak trees that have stood witness to generations of hunters like us. As we delve deeper into this dark labyrinth, I think of my hometown of Poznan and its bustling city life full of pleasant distractions, a stark contrast to this eerie place. We find something unnerving near a small clearing it's a poorly concealed grave, pieces of clothing sticking out from between the hastily thrown together rocks and soil. Katarzyna radios in the discovery but something isn't right. These woods have seen a fair share of homicides over the years. But what makes this different is the brutal nature of the crime. The body has been viciously mangled beyond recognition. Suddenly, we hear a chilling cry echoing through the forest that sends shivers down our spines. Another member of our team shouts over the radio. We need backup immediately. It's here and it's fast. As we rush towards their location at breakneck speed while clutching our firearms tightly, I can't help but feel skeptical about how a creature we've never encountered or even heard about could be wreaking such havoc. Our task force has seen its fair share of monstrous beings, but nothing like this. We reach the scene to see our teammates, Yosef and Amelia, visibly shaken. It was enormous, covered in rough fur. It had massive curved horns and powerful limbs built for destruction. Amelia stammers with uncharacteristic fear in her voice. Yosef tries to lighten the mood, making a joke about having to change his pants afterward, but there is no denying the horror we're all experiencing. As we press on in pursuit of this terrifying creature, we find increasingly more gruesome evidence of its capabilities disemboweled deer, wounded or missing team members, vicious claw marks etched into tree trunks, or the ground itself. The details of its carnage are scattered throughout the dark woods telling a horrifying story of power and savagery. Hearts pounding in our chests and senses alert for any sounds, we stumble upon a clearing where the elusive creature seems to have stopped momentarily. Its enormous footprints are clearly visible in the mud with broken branches above us indicating its likely passage. 
Tension rises amongst us as we nervously scan our surroundings, weapons ready and waiting for anything that may come our way. Our fear turns from mere anticipation to an overwhelming sense of dread as we commit to pursuing this unstoppable force. Engulfed by darkness and terror, we forge onwards driven by our commitment to protect others from this horrifying foe whose name remains unknown to us. Time seems distorted as we lose track of how long we've been searching when finally, Katarzyna spots something a beam of light cutting through the stormy skies illuminates it briefly. There it stands, a gigantic beast snarling in defiance as its eyes bore into ours filled with unhinged fury. In that moment, standing face to face with the horrifying creature, Amelia finally manages to regain her voice. Run! She screams, as our group splits in different directions, desperately trying to escape the monster's wrath. As we sprint through the woods, we hear the beast's heavy footsteps echo behind us, gaining ground quickly. Our minds race, trying to process the situation and figure out our best course of action. Katarzyna suggests we could try calling for help but Yosef reminds us that we are too deep in the woods to have any cell phone signal. Despite understanding our current inability to call for help, I can't help but think about what kind of explanations we would even give to the authorities. The creature looks unlike anything I've ever seen or heard of, a horrifying combination of animalistic features forming a deadly force. Suddenly, Andre trips on a tree root and falls hard onto the ground. The sound of his pained grunt is drowned by a ferocious growl coming from behind us. I glance back and see the colossal creature closing in on Andre at an unbelievable speed. Our hearts ache as we understand it's too late for our friend none of us could reach him in time or fight off this monstrous predator. As we flee further away from Andre's screams, Amelia suggests we split up, finding it more difficult to pick us off one by one. Perhaps it would give some of us a better chance at survival. Reluctantly agreeing with her plan, we split into two groups. Yosef and Katarzyna head east while Amelia and I move westward. Stealthily navigating through the dense forest foliage, either group speaks all that matters is survival. In total silence... Minutes stretch into hours as our adrenaline pumps through our veins. The pain from cuts and bruises fade into nothingness as fear drives us forward. With each rustling of the leaves, we question if it's the wind or the creature stalking us, ready to strike. Suddenly, a piercing scream cuts through the air. Although it's distant, there's no mistaking that it was Katarzyna. My mind races with horrible images of her mutilated body lying somewhere in this cursed forest. Tears cloud Amelia's eyes as she realizes that another friend might have fallen victim to the terrifying creature. Seized by desperation, Amelia has a sudden surge of determination. We have to find help, she insists as she notices a faint glow on the horizon. We hope that it signifies civilization and can save us from the horrifying ordeal. But as we stumble towards the light, exhaustion and injury encumber our every step instead of offering respite, we come across Andre's remains by sheer accident. Unrecognizable, it sends shivers coursing through our spines before terror and despair drive us back into motion. Finally reaching the source of the light, we are relieved to find a small village at the edge of the woods. Collapsing onto the ground, we beg residents for help as they gather around us. We provide as much detail as possible about our ordeal, describing the unnerving appearance and vicious attacks of this unfathomable creature. In an attempt to appease us while waiting for help to arrive, a kind villager tells us rumors of large predators occupying these woods although none had ever observed them up close or lived to tell their tale. This piece of information reinforces the monstrous being's mysterious nature. In the darkness before dawn, help finally arrives and takes us out of harm's way. 
The village fades into the distance as we leave behind not only the nightmare that had seemed never-ending but also Andre and Katarzyna's bodies as gruesome evidence of its reality. Sworn to silence and disbelief by those who heard our account, we can only mourn the lives lost to the creature's unstoppable fury. Their memory lingers with us long after our nightmarish ordeal ends, a painful reminder of the unknown dangers lurking in the shadows. And though its name and origins remain unsure, one truth stays painfully clear this terrifying foe continues to exist, prowling in search of its next prey. I'm Alex Slater, and the damp forest of Aptus Creek Trail has never felt so menacing. The trees towered overhead, their branches entwined like twisted fingers. Mud sucked at my boots as I trudged ahead, accompanied by the rest of my task force. Our leader, Zara Ivanich, was an imposing woman with a stern expression permanently etched on her face. She had been with the squad for years specializing in hunting and tracking monsters. She nodded towards Leonardo Hassan, our no-nonsense tech guy who made sure we stayed connected to HQ during missions. Marisol Vilcarlo cinched closer to me, trying to dispel the silence that clung to us like a shroud. You know, Alex, she whispered nervously. I always wanted to get into real estate. I offered her a small smile and nod as mutual understanding grew between us. We all had pasts that had brought us here, some more grim than others. As we trekked through the muddy trail, it became clear that something sinister had happened in these woods. The mission started because an entire family had gone missing during a camping trip. After hours of scouring one area after another, we soon discovered what appeared to be drag marks leading deeper into the dense foliage. A chilling scream sliced through the air just as we approached an eerie clearing bathed in shadows. The sudden noise sent a surge of adrenaline through my veins. We fanned out, weapons drawn as we investigated the source of the shrill cry. Zara instructed Marisal and Leonardo to follow her while motioning for me to investigate a path leading down towards a dark ravine. As I descended carefully, my eyes swept left and right looking for anything out of place. When I reached the bottom, I saw it. This creature was unlike anything I'd ever witnessed. It was massive in size, snake-like but coiled like a spring ready to pounce at a moment's notice. Its scales appeared to be razor-sharp and gleaming in the dappled sunlight that barely pierced through the treetops of the forest. Its eyes were so black they seemed to absorb all light, preventing me from discerning any emotions or thoughts. I slowly backed away, the mere sight of this creature chilling me to the core. The absence of any witnesses or survivors fueled my darkest fears— Whatever this thing was doing was far from typical predation. I scrambled back up the ravine, desperate to share what I'd seen with my teammates. Reunited, disbelief and terror filled their eyes as I recounted my encounter. Zara squeezed her lips into a tight line before stoically ordering us to maintain focus on the task at hand finding the missing family. Time dragged by as we continued searching for answers. Darkness fell over like a thick veil, but it couldn't hide or quench the growing sense of unease and dread that followed us with each passing hour. I've got something! Leonardo exclaimed suddenly, causing us all to startle from our haggard thoughts. His fingers flew across his portable touchpad as he brought up recently captured satellite images. There's a trail in the woods about half a mile from here. It might lead to an underground lair where this thing could be hiding. Marisol clenched her fists nervously at this new development, while Zara simply gave a curt command. Move out. We double-checked our firearms and pressed on towards our new destination. 
The trail led through winding, now branches before opening into a small chamber beneath moss-covered rocks. I ran a hand through my damp hair as we prepared to enter, breathing deep and trading one last glance with my teammates. What do you think we'll find down there? Marisol asked, her voice barely a whisper. Leonardo glanced at her, then back to his device. There's movement, he hissed his eyes wide with terror. We cautiously approached the chamber entrance, struggling to maintain a composed facade. We hoped that calling for backup would not be necessary, as our communications devices might not work underground and each minute wasted could mean the family's demise. As we entered the chamber, it became apparent that we were in what seemed to be a labyrinth of tunnels narrow, cramped, and damp. The air was thick with an overwhelming stench, making us gag and hold our breaths whenever we could. Navigating through the tunnels, we relied on Leonardo's tracking and mapping to guide us. Our ears were pricked for any sounds coming from the missing family, or worse, the creature that had invaded our world. Within minutes, we stumbled upon grisly signs of violence-torn clothing, shattered bones and smears of blood splattered across the walls. It was a gruesome sight we could barely stomach. It resembled nothing any of us had ever seen before. At last, we heard faint cries echoing through the chambers which intensified our efforts. Following the sounds, we finally entered a room where we found the terrorized family huddled together in one corner. They were alive but visibly injured. As relief washed over us momentarily, Leonardo's tracker emitted an alarming beep. He whispered urgently, It's here! We understood that time was running out. Suddenly, Zara spotted movement from the corner of her eye. Turning swiftly with her firearm raised, she faced a creature unlike anything we'd ever encountered before. It stood before us on two muscular legs covered in scales with arms that ended in sharp talons gleaming under the light of our torches. Its eyes were soulless black orbs that seemed to penetrate deep into our own as it bared its razor-sharp teeth. It, Marisol stuttered, it knows where they are. It's coming after them. We couldn't afford to wait for help now it was kill or be killed. We formed a protective barrier around the family, our guns locked and loaded, ready for the imminent attack. The tension in the air was palpable as the creature assessed its prey. With a growl that shook us to our core, it lunged towards Zara. She managed to dodge it, but it struck with terrifying speed and precision, penetrating her shoulder with its talon. With adrenaline pumping through our veins, we circled the beast guns firing as we struggled to keep it at bay. It was relentless retaliating with brute strength and determination that matched our own. With no choice but to press on, we gradually wore the creature down until, eventually, it lay motionless on the ground. The family was saved but there were injuries to attend to both physical and emotional. Zara's injury required immediate attention. Marisol tore a strip of cloth from her shirt and applied pressure on Zara's shoulder to stem the bleeding. As I looked back at the creature whose species I could only assume to exist in some underground world unbeknownst to mankind, I felt a chill run down my spine. This battle may have ended, but who knew what other horrors lurked in the unknown depths? With determination and camaraderie solidifying our resolve, we hastily led the family out of the labyrinth and into safety, thoughts of the gruesome encounter replaying in our minds. Once above ground, we called for backup and medical assistance to tend to everyone's injuries while ensuring that others would be informed about this hidden danger lurking beneath their feet. Despite suffering significant losses and living through an experience none of us would ever forget or be able to shake off entirely, we successfully achieved our goal, reuniting a devastated family while protecting them from an unearthly force of unimaginable horror. Days later as we sat together recovering from our ordeal, 
haunted by the memory of that creature's horrific visage and ruthless nature, we took solace knowing that our team's tireless efforts had made a tangible difference in the world. It was an icy cold night in Alaska when I, Arnold Nicholthorne, received the call. As a member of the Alpha Task Force, my team and I specialized in hunting and tracking monsters, an occupation that had consumed our lives for years. My crew consisted of Beatrix Ahe and Quincy Tharp, skilled trackers and fighters who had experienced their fair share of creature encounters. We huddled in our makeshift campsite, deep within the Alaskan wilderness, awaiting further instructions. The target's been spotted near Dead Man Bay, Beatrix announced, her voice grave as we took a moment to exchange worried glances. We had heard stories of this area, tales of missing persons and unexplained deaths. As we trekked through the dense forest toward Dead Man Bay, I shared with them about my past as a law enforcement officer and how life changed after my brother disappeared under mysterious circumstances. They provided comfort. It wasn't the first time someone in our line of work had lost someone important. Our journey was slow. The snowy terrain made it even more strenuous than usual. My muscles ached from the weight of my pack, but I couldn't complain. This was what we'd signed up for. Nearing the bay, we discovered fresh prints in the snow, inhuman but deliberate. The creature we were hunting bore a striking resemblance to a massive bear or wolf, or some impossible hybrid of the two, but monstrously larger and more intimidating than anything we'd encountered before. Its black fur glistened under what little light penetrated the thick canopy overhead. With each step closer to our prey, anticipation gripped us tightly. This expedition had taken us far from any known civilization. We were completely removed from any possibility of reinforcements. If something were to go awry during this mission, no one would know until it was too late. Finally reaching our destination near Dead Man Bay, we spotted a mutilated tree, its bark torn and shredded. This was the first sign of the carnage to come. Eyes alert, Quincy scanned the area as Beatrix maintained her silent vigil on our flank. A sudden crack of branches startled us, and we tensed in anticipation. Before we had time to react, the creature lunged from its hiding spot, a blur of black fur and froth-covered jaws grabbing onto Quincy's shoulder. He cried out in agony. Unholstering my firearm, I fired a shot that managed to hit the beast's side, but it only seemed enraged by this small offense. Beatrix wrenched a flare from her pack, igniting it with practiced skill and waving it like an impromptu torch, an attempt to keep this monstrous thing at bay. We knew that firearms wouldn't suffice for our task. Heavier ordnance was required. I have an idea. I shouted to my comrades over the sounds of snarls and gunfire. Quincy, bleeding but determined, nodded in agreement while gritting his teeth. Go! We'll hold it off! He managed between pain gasps. Without hesitation, I sprinted back through the forest toward a concealed crate containing explosives. In all our careful calculations and planning, this contingency had been painstakingly put into place for situations just like this one. As I grabbed the crate and sprinted back toward the chaos... I could hear my friends fighting valiantly against this monstrous foe. We couldn't afford any fear or hesitation. Speeding back into the fray with my payload secured tightly, my heart raced but not from exertion alone. Every fiber in my body was poised for victory as I neared the unfolding battle scene. My comrades were still holding their own against the ferocious beast when I arrived though barely able to keep a safe distance from its powerful claws. I hurled an explosive right at the creature's feet and bellowed. Clear out! 
my friends scrambled out of the creature's range just in time. The explosion shook the ground violently. Chunks of dirt and singed fur flew through the air. As debris rained down, the beast roared in pain. However, it didn't seem mortally wounded. It thrashed wildly but remained incredibly resilient. We knew we needed to act fast. With no time for alternative strategies, I gestured for my companions to gather the remaining explosives. We had only a few moments while the creature was disoriented. Once we had our remaining ammunition, we split up to surround the lumbering mass of terror, intent on bringing it down once and for all. Movement was crucial. We needed to keep our distance from its sharp claws and its snapping jaw while peppering it with gunfire and improvised explosives. Quincy darted to one side, narrowly dodging a swipe of its powerful arm as he tossed a package. Beatrix lobbed her own explosive concoction toward its head, seeking to blind it temporarily or at least disrupt its seemingly relentless pursuit. I circled around back, placing my last explosive as carefully as I could beneath what appeared to be a weak point. On my signal, we all retreated even further, fleeing with everything we had to avoid the chaos about to unfold. As all our improvised devices detonated simultaneously, even more earth erupted into the air around our quarry. When the dust settled and silence followed suit, we crept back slowly, prepared for anything, or so we thought. What awaited us astounded us more than anything we had ever encountered during our odd profession— Dozens of wriggling serpentine creatures lay spread before us, an apparent symbiotic collective that had somehow been working together as one monstrous beast. Each snake-like thing looked bruised from our assault. Those whose heads weren't crushed seemed groggy or disoriented. Some bore a stretchy fur-like pattern all along their bodies, which must have given a deceptive appearance of a single large creature. It was extraordinary that these creatures coordinated so flawlessly to act as a single entity. Quincy took out his radio, deciding now was the time to call for help. We need backup immediately, he hissed. It's too big and complex for us to handle alone. We could only pray that our higher-ups would believe us, let alone get assistance to our location before this mass of creatures regrouped or dispersed entirely. Backup arrived just in time to subdue the individual animals with nets, tranquilizers, and restraints. An expert in wildlife was flown in, seeking to identify and understand these unnerving creatures. During the debriefing, we learned that these serpentine beings were a previously undocumented species, potentially an invasive one at that. It seemed they had been hiding in plain sight for years in the forest we specialized in clearing of dangerous flora and fauna. Further study would be crucial to understanding how these creatures function together in such coordinated mimicry. After completing one hell of a report on this incredible turn of events, my team and I promised each other a well-earned break from fieldwork. We left the site scarred but alive, grateful we had gone into that tumultuous situation with preparation on our side. We went our separate ways for some time afterward before reuniting once more to research this unbelievable species. Armed with knowledge and even more caution than ever, we pursued it, not as adversaries but as passionate students seeking to learn all we could about their behavior and potential threats they might pose. From then on, our unit shifted gears as well. While still seeking out dangerous tasks and desperately trying to protect those unknowingly endangered by bizarre abominations lurking on our planet's fringes, we also began exploring the world around us with newfound respect, not merely intent on removing perceived threats, but instead seeking to understand what had shaped and sustained these life forms in the first place.
The red sun was setting over the dense evergreens of the Pacific Northwest as I, James Talbot, rolled into the small logging town of Clearwater. The towering trees seemed to close in around me, but that was just my mind playing tricks. Clearing my thoughts, I took in the picturesque scene before me. Life seemed to carry on normally here, almost too ordinary for a special operative like me. I belonged to a unique task force that hunted and tracked down creatures most people thought didn't exist. I remember my father telling me stories about our ancestral home back in Ireland, where he encountered an odd creature during one fateful night. His recollection was vivid enough to give anyone the chills and served as an impetus for me to join this line of work. My car stopped at the town's only gas station, an old-school establishment that had seen better days. As I filled up the tank, I struck up a conversation with locals who were sipping coffee under the crackling neon sign that read, Mike's Gas and Go. They bantered in hushed voices about their day-to-day -day lives jobs, relationships, sports, and it wasn't long before the constant drizzle joined us. Taking cover inside the quaint store by the cashier, I casually asked if they'd heard any strange stories recently. Irene Pellerin, a woman with weathered yet lively eyes, spoke up hesitantly about a couple who had gone missing near a remote location called Raven's Rock Deep in the Woods. At Irene's words, others chimed in with their own tales of sudden disappearances and gruesome happenings, each account more horrifying than the last. Mangled belongings found strewn about, mysterious footprints leading nowhere. Raven's Rock took center stage in these ominous folk tales. I couldn't let it pass. Raven's Rock seemed an ideal first step on my mission. With map directions firmly in hand, I trudged back to my rental car, the ominous rain battering the windshield. The next day, a ragtag group gathered at the edge of the woods, now as intertwined with Raven's Rock and its legends as the roots beneath our feet. Among us were Jack Plored a burly lumberjack and Evie Baptiste with piercing blue eyes accompanied by her loyal hound, Puck. Visibility diminished as we charged further into the maze of evergreens. Through the pulsating downpour, Evie picked up on something peculiar. Puck's usual energetic bark was gone, replaced instead by a low, guttural growl. Jack whispered about the wind. It had a strange quality, like thousands of tiny invisible claws scrabbling around our bodies. We tried to brush it off as mere superstition, but it seemed like the woods were sharing their own take on that pervasive eeriness we just couldn't shrug off. As if on cue, a blood-curdling scream tore through the air. Not even giving ourselves time to think we barreled towards the noise only to stumble upon a grisly scene at the edge of a glen. We wanted credible proof for our mission. We just hadn't prepared for what Raven's Rock was about to get us acquainted with. A man lay motionless near an upturned truck, his body twisted gruesomely displaying massive claw marks across his skin. Deadened eyes stared into oblivion. Disbelief mixed with sheer terror had forever etched themselves onto his cold face. Clearly shaken but determined to know more about this creature that was haunting Clearwater's residence and how it left such morbid fingerprints on their psyches. Our nexus was stronger than before. We exchanged glances, our breathing heavy and faces pale. Puck was no longer growling. Instead, he whimpered and clung to Evie's side. Our group decided we needed to leave, but not without trying to alert someone of our chilling discovery. With no phone signal in these woods, the plan was for Jack to take the lead and find our way out while I tagged along just behind him. As we moved cautiously, Jack occasionally tried his cell phone, hoping for a signal. The further we went into the woods, the more tense our surroundings became. It felt as though we were being watched. Did you hear that? Evie suddenly whispered. We all froze, listening intently for any sounds out of place. 
A rustle caught my ear from behind us. Something was there. Panic set in as a large figure came into view from between the trees. It had an unnaturally muscular body covered in dark, coarse hair, with arms that seemed far too long for its size. Its face was a horrifying mix of human and animal features, sunken eyes that flashed menacingly with hunger, a wide mouth filled with razor-sharp teeth, and skin pulled so taut it looked like it was about to tear open. Unable to contain my fear any longer, I yelled out to Jack, Run! We sprinted blindly in hopes of escaping this monstrous creature. It closed on us quickly, its grotesque limbs reaching out hungrily. I stumbled and turned back to find my comrades gone, all save for Evie's faithful hound Puck, who stood growling at the beast. It lunged towards Puck. I knew there was nothing I could do but keep running. Eventually I spotted Jack and Evie ahead of me, yelling and waving their arms frantically. As we converged on one another breathlessly near a steep hillside path leading beyond the ravine's edge, we were overwhelmed with both relief and an unending fear for Puck's fate. We reached the bottom of the hill to find a small town not too far away from us. There would be the opportunity to call for help and report the dead man in the glen. With weak voices, we recounted our harrowing experience to the bewildered but sympathetic townspeople. The local authorities were notified of the mauled corpse we had found earlier, and a search party was organized. As night fell, we were dismayed to learn that our valiant Puck and the lifeless hiker were never found. Days turned into weeks, and we couldn't shake the terror that remained from our encounter with the mysterious creature. We collectively decided not to explore those woods again. We wouldn't want anything from there to follow us out. Other townspeople began to mention strange encounters in nearby areas, giving further weight to the reality of what we faced. To this day, there are no answers, only theories and whispers. As time goes by, I continue to ponder over that day. The monstrous beast remains a thorn in my memory a grim reminder of an unfathomable existence not meant for human eyes or understanding. The gruesome attack on that unfortunate man and the heroic self-sacrifice of dear Puck will resonate within me forever, haunting proof that some things in this world remain better left unknown. But through it all lingers one lingering thought. It wasn't until weeks later I realized that during our panicked escape from that horrifying creature— None of us had ever caught a glimpse of its legs or lower body. We still have no idea what kind of thing it could have been, and perhaps that's for the best. I'm Jackson Palmer, and my heart races as I lay hidden in the underbrush in the black forest of Germany. My brother-in-arms, Marcus Engel, remains quiet beside me. Our task force specializes in hunting and tracking monsters, monsters most people don't even know exist. As I lay here, memories of joining the force surface, escaping a life of hardship where I had to fight for every scrap back home. A faint crack echoes in the distance as our partner, Marjorie Bro radios and to report that the creature is approaching nearer. We acknowledge her and exchange a determined nod with Marcus. The hairs on my neck stand on end, anticipating the inevitable encounter with something we've yet to understand fully. Our new informant, Raymond Schumacher, described how this creature could maim its prey beyond recognition before devouring them, each time in an entirely new approach. The thought sends chills down my spine. Gradually, over weeks of making phone calls and digging into strange disappearances reported here, we'd pieced together enough information to track down its lair. Our fellow comrade on this mission, Frederica Schoenfeld, follows Raymond through the dense forest armed with her trusty shotgun. 
Raymond himself carries a knife kept sharp enough to be a surgeon's scalpel. Hope sneaks into my mind that our collective skills will give us a fighting chance against this wretched beast. Marcus breaks away still tension with a story about his wild youth and an ill-advised night spent camping deep within these woods, an attempt to amuse us, but it does nothing to distract from our eerie surroundings. Tall trees cast ghostly shadows onto the forest floor. Logs lie rotting where they've fallen. Thick, fragrant moss covers almost everything within sight. Just as we finish sharing silent laughs at Marcus' story, we hear another sound in the distance, an unearthly scream that cuts through the forest. Fear tenses my body and I sense an urgency in my comrades. Marjorie joins us, takes a deep breath, and begins describing the monster she just spotted, partially covered in fur. It stands on two legs, with dark, beady eyes and claws like jaggers. She swears it was able to shadow her steps faster than any creature known to man. A sinking feeling grows in my gut. Though he doesn't say it out loud, Marcus can't shake the feeling now that he's heard those terrible cries before, even if only in distant memories of his teenage bravado. The sun slides out of sight and shadows lengthen as we move through the dense foliage. Whispers fill the air from Frederica and Raymond, who scouted further ahead to find our deepest fears confirmed, a ghastly hole filled with bones, pieces of flesh strewn about, leading into a dark cave, the malicious markings of our beast. Biting back bile, we gather our courage and strength for this deadly confrontation. Desperation fuels us each time we recall unsolved cases that haunt us. We know there's no choice but to hunt this predator before it claims more lives. It's not long before even Raymond falls silent. Dread grips our tiny band. The forest is devoid of stars tonight. Even the familiar chirps and rustles are hushed as if that earlier cry has silenced everything in its path. Sudden snarls echo from within the encroaching darkness around us. We tense as one by one. In versions of nightmarish deja vu, we're yanked away into the void. Piercing yells shatter my reverie. I suddenly realize Marcus is gone, leaving only frantic whispers over his interrupted communication line, while remaining squad members struggle to pinpoint his location. I call out for Marcus, hoping that my voice would reach him, but there's no response. We are left with a terrible silence that settles upon the remaining squad members. The pressing need to survive outweighs any other urge, and I manage to convince everyone that we have to move forward. We hope we can find our missing comrades and escape this horror. As we make our way through the dense trees and underbrush, a grotesque figure lunges at us from within the darkness. Frederica takes the brunt of its assault as long, Clawed fingers tear into her flesh. We fire back, though it's unclear whether our bullets wound the beast or not. It retreats into the shadows, leaving Frederica horribly injured. She can't continue with us and urges us to press on. She knows she won't survive long. Raymond stays behind with her, trying to provide some comfort and protection before whatever may come for them next. I protest but he insists this is what they both want under such dire circumstances. Their selfless act is something I cannot fathom in that moment as I reluctantly move forward with the rest of the squad members. We stumble upon a cave entrance deep within the forest. An eerie feeling floods me as I suspect this could be our best chance at finding our friends. Conversing with one another as softly as possible, we decide to enter in search of Marcus and possibly a way out of this nightmare. Upon entering the cave system, we're met with scattered bones and half-eaten remains, grim reminders of what had become of previous victims of this monstrous creature. A stench fills the air, thick enough to taste, a putrid mix of decay and blood. Inside one chamber of the cave lies a lifeless body. It's Marcus. 
or what little remains of him after savagely being torn apart by powerful claws and jaws. The gruesome sight is almost too much. However, a faint glimmer of determination sparks within me as I consider how terrible it would be to allow this evil to continue claiming innocent lives. Though we're filled with grief, we search further through the cave, intent on finding the way out before the creature comes for us next. We traverse through endless labyrinths, passing dreadful reminders of its cruel meal choices. The divisions between nightmare and reality begin to blur as the horrors we find increase in their grotesqueness. As we delve deeper into the darkness, we realize that the creature is stalking us, lurking just out of sight. Desperation claws its way into our hearts, yet we are furiously resolved not to allow our steadfast efforts end in vain. Seemingly trapped, a stroke of luck, or perhaps misfortune, leads us to discover a small opening hidden behind a veil of thick foliage. As the first beams of sunlight greet our battered senses, I know little solace seeing the remaining squad members emerging from the cave one by one. We know we've left friends behind, victims of that horrific predator lurking in these woods, and it's a burden that will haunt us for eternity. Once out of the cave and back into the woods we take only moments to decide to push forward towards civilization, hoping someone can offer help or answers as to what has been terrorizing this once tranquil area. As we move, there's no time for contemplation or explanation. We keep close ranks and focus on locating our comrades who did not emerge with us. We reach a nearby town and find little relief among its inhabitants. They are well aware of the unexplained events that have taken place before and it has left them terrified and distrusting of outsiders. As our tale unfolds before them, they drop their suspicions and communicate that it was said an enormous beast, a long-forgotten creature once thought fiction, has been haunting these woods hundreds of years. We find little satisfaction in this revelation, the reality of this being no less horrifying if a name were placed upon it. We gather our remaining strength and together leave this once peaceful place, never to be the same. In horror, we will remember those who were taken from us by the monstrous creature, consuming ourselves with guilt for our helplessness. As time goes on, stories are told of our ordeal, and yet they barely scratch the surface of the horrific truth. The terrifying events that transpired that dreadful week will remain forever etched into our very souls. I'm Samuel Shore, working with a specialized task force in hunting and tracking monstrous creatures. Our latest mission led us deep into the Redwood National Park, California. The forest here is dense and sprawling, ancient trees looming high above. My team consists of Ellen Sparks, our sharpshooter, and Ivan Voronov, an experienced tracker. We work well together upholding a sense of camaraderie in the face of supernatural danger. One morning, at our campsite, Ivan shared his concerns about the loss of radio contact with headquarters. We chalked it up to the thick woods interfering with the signal and set out to follow the trail of a creature that had left a string of bizarre killings in its wake. It started a week ago with an entire family found murdered in their home located on the outskirts of the park. The scene was horrifying, bodies brutally mangled and dismembered. The modus operandi was like nothing we had ever seen before. As we ventured deeper into the dense thicket, Ivan's unease grew visibly. When I asked him about it, he told me about his family's harrowing experiences during World War II nonchalantly. With everything he's been through, being here felt disquieting. We discovered remains later that day, finding human bones scattered in a clearing. Though distressing, this find emphasized the importance of our mission. 
Our search continued for days without encountering any creature but gradually uncovering increasingly ghastly evidence. Tension among us tightened considerably as we realized just how unpredictable this monster could be. Alongside gnawing uncertainty came tinges of dark humor, self-deprecation to maintain sanity. I've been quipped that if this monster didn't end him someday, his cooking certainly would make short work of us all. A thunderous crunch resounded one night when we unexpectedly stumbled across the creature in question, a hulking figure resembling a wild beast with grotesque features, scales rather than fur, and large, dark eyes. The thing seemed surprised by our presence, and we stared at the leering monster in equal shock. We had never seen such a vile entity before. It bore sharp-looking teeth and claws that could rip through flesh with ease. When the creature lunged at Ivan in a lightning-fast motion, Ellen responded deftly, shooting it in the shoulder. Wounded, it thrashed around in pain and anger before fleeing into the underbrush. We pursued it doggedly through dense foliage, staying close to one another in the gloom of the forest. But regardless of how quickly we moved, the creature seemed to elude us effortlessly. We stumbled upon a cluster of mutilated corpses further down, people who had been missing from nearby towns, strung up between trees like gruesome ornaments. Desperate to put an end to this monster's reign of terror once and for all, we discussed our options over a makeshift campfire. Talking about our lives outside of this hunting world was always strangely comforting. Frustration took its hold on us when we momentarily lost the creature's trail. Ivan encouraged us not to lose hope. He admitted this creature was different but knew we could outsmart it together. We devised a trap luring the beast with fresh meat into a pitfall lined with sharp stakes. But as we waited for night to fall, nothing could prepare us for what was about to happen. As the sun dipped below the horizon, the three of us discussed our strategy for dealing with this monstrosity. We had this one chance to end it all in a well-devised, coordinated attack. While Ellen and Ivan quickly gathered materials for the trap, I was tasked with finding fresh meat to lure the creature to its impending doom. As I scavenged for prey, my thoughts wandered back to why we hadn't called for help. It seemed the reasonable thing to do in such a situation. But what bothered us was how we could explain this grotesque being without sounding insane. Moreover, there was always a danger that others might get hurt, or even killed. So, we decided to handle this on our own and put an end to the creature's vicious reign of terror. Returning with a handful of rabbits hanging over my shoulder, I found Ellen and Ivan constructing the pitfall. Silently, we nodded in agreement and began luring the creature with the scent of fresh blood. Hours crawled by as we waited in anticipation after sunset. Suddenly, we heard rustling leaves approaching hastily from behind us. We braced ourselves for the incoming assault, tightening our grip on our weapons as we aimed into the darkness. The vile thing appeared from between the trees more massive than before. Its scales glistened under the moonlight as it let out an ear-splitting screech. Unnerved but determined, we prepared ourselves for its attack but were caught off guard when several smaller versions of the beast emerged from the shadows skulking toward us aggressively. Is it, is it reproducing? Ivan muttered in horror, subconsciously raising his voice. I don't know, but we need to stick to our plan. Ellen urged as she gripped her gun tightly and began targeting one of the smaller creatures. Remembering our primary objective killing that bigger beast we split up as best as we could while still keeping an eye on one another. I set off after the main creature as it charged towards the trap barely dodging the creature's attacks as they tried to claw at me from every direction. I soon realized we had unknowingly attracted these offspring as well using the meat. This was completely unplanned and put a wrench in our strategy. Underestimating the opponents, 
Ivan got attacked by one of the offspring right across his chest. As he writhed in pain, Ellen and I managed to eliminate most of the smaller ones while the large monster edged closer to our pitfall trap. This is our chance. Go for it now! Ellen yelled, fending off the last two offspring as I sprinted towards the cornered beast. In one swift motion, I dove forward and tackled the creature into our trap. A guttural cry of agony echoed through the forest as it got impaled on massive stakes. Blood dripped all around me, a testament to our victory. We allowed ourselves a moment to breathe before looking at each other. Ivan's injury needed immediate attention, and we still had to clean up this gruesome mass of bodies. With determination, we left behind not only a nightmare but also a question that lingered in our minds. What exactly was this creature? Knowing too well it wasn't anything like what we had encountered before, we could only assume its species existed within unexplored depths of this earth unknown yet to humanity. As we limped away, desperately seeking medical assistance for Ivan while carrying with us not only scars but also a reminder of those lost in this horrendous ordeal we knew that whatever happened onward— we fought back not just for ourselves but for those who couldn't be saved. And if such monstrosity dared return again or others surfaced from hellish depths, we would stand united without a second thought to send them back where they belong. I'm James Crosby standing on the jagged rocks of Caraja's National Forest in Brazil with the rest of my task force. Our objective, hunt down an unknown creature involved in multiple disappearances. I used to be a detective before joining this team. Missing persons cases always hit too close to home due to my mother's disappearance when I was young. Early morning sun filtered through the dense trees as we began hiking deeper into the forest. My teammate Ramona Perez, our tech expert, signaled the hidden cave entrance up ahead. I shared jokes with her as we trekked forward, lightening the tense atmosphere surrounding us. Entering the cave, we discovered disturbing elements, like bloody handprints on the walls and scattered human remains. The stench inside made me clench my teeth and conjure up terrible images of violence in my mind. We should set a perimeter, secure this place fast, Ramona suggested in a low voice. We split into groups and followed her instructions with military precision. Within hours, communication devices were set up. Theo Clark, our weapons specialist, sat down with Emma Russell our strategist and me, distributing firearms and blades. As dusk approached, we noticed someone staggering towards our camp, a local man covered in blood and dirt. My friend's gone! He cried between sobs. We got lost, saw something. We tried calming him down but couldn't extract much valuable information. Instead, Emma organized a search party for his friends while theorizing possible scenarios. The following day brought no sight of them. Even Emma's strategic genius seemed futile against whatever creature inhabited these woods. On our third day in Karaja's national forest, something changed. Dread suffused the air around us. That night I heard rustling sounds outside my tent and felt paralyzed by fear. Ramona screamed from her tent. Everybody dashed out to see a nightmarish being attacking her, hulking and muscular, with thick skin and elongated claws. It sliced through the camp like an unstoppable force. Despite a hail of gunfire and Theo's best efforts, the creature took down multiple members of the task force. Emma exercised cunning tactics leading us in brief moments of advantage. However, no attempt to kill or capture the horror before us was successful. The creature dragged away its victims leaving distinct claw marking that would haunt our dreams for years to come. 
We were helpless as more teammates vanished throughout nights when the creature attacked. No amount of strategy or firepower seemed to matter. We radioed for backup but learned that none would be coming. We'd entered the domain of an unknown predator on a secret mission. Our only hope was to survive while it hunted us one by one. During a rare quiet moment, while hiding under hastily constructed brush camouflage, I mulled over what this ordeal felt like, trapped in an eternal game with no end in sight. My mind wandered back to my mother's disappearance. Had she been taken by the monster that haunted these woods? As the creature continued its relentless assault, we struggled to maintain our composure. Our fellow survivors and I decided that we needed a plan, quickly. Each night, we set up different traps around the camp, hoping to ensnare the monstrosity. Time and time again, it eluded our makeshift traps with its cunning intellect or brute strength. The sense of camaraderie among us began to crumble as more people disappeared each day. Our conversations became terse, focused solely on survival rather than mourning our losses. We all knew that hope was slipping through our fingers like sand. I overheard Emma on the radio, calling for help one last time. But there was still no reply. How could there be? We had been abandoned. The realization brought despair but also a determined resolve to face this unfathomable nightmare and protect those who remained. Another member of our group, Marcus, suggested that perhaps setting a fire near a pit trap would work to our advantage. Desperate and running out of ideas, we reluctantly agreed to try his strategy. The night arrived as it always did, cloaked in terror. As the fire roared near the pit, masked by other smaller fires that kept it difficult for the creature to pinpoint our location, we waited in anticipation. Not long after darkness settled around us, we heard it, approaching footsteps from the trees while sniffing the air suspiciously. It had sensed something was amiss but could not quite discern what lay ahead either. Suddenly, driven by hunger or anger or both perhaps, it charged at the fire with terrifying speed. In one swift movement, I threw a log in its path and simultaneously Marcus detonated a small explosive just behind it, forcing it closer towards the pit. It fell in, momentarily trapped but not for long. With its fearsome howl echoing through the forest like a war cry issued against humanity itself, Creature clawed at the walls of the pit in a frenzy attempting to escape and enact its revenge. This was our only chance. Running towards it with every ounce of strength I had left, I threw what remaining explosives we had into the pit. Boom! Deafening noises accompanied by choking smoke spread throughout the area, only marginally assuaging my frantic heartbeat. We inched closer to the pit, fearful that somehow it remained unscathed. Peering over, we saw no sign of life within the charred hole left from our explosives. Theo murmured something about there being more than one creature before thrashing through the underbrush. The enormity of our losses weighed heavily on all of us. After that night, we focused on finding our way out of the forest, searching for any sign of civilization. No longer did we care about our original directive or mission— what mattered now was returning home to warn others about these creatures lurking in the dark shadows of Karaja's national forest. Finally, after many days of weary travel with limited supplies, we stumbled upon a small settlement. Our ragged clothing and the smell of smoke still clinging to us told an inarguable story. We had encountered unfathomable horror and had somehow lived to tell the tale. News spread among settlements about our tragedy. A sudden light shone on the evil that lurked beneath Karaja's national forest's beauty. People refused to enter those forbidden grounds ever again, and tales were whispered from generation to generation about those who had challenged a new species' existence and paid for it with their lives. In somber gatherings around flickering fires, 
families remembered Ramona's agonizing screams or Marcus's stubborn determination. One by one, they whispered names of those snatched away by that nightmare in the woods. Still numb with grief and anger at everything that transpired during those fateful days and nights, I could only whisper some advice to the living, never venture into the dark corners of Karaja's national forest, for there are things in this world better left undisturbed. I'm Gabriel, and I stood in the dense forest of Green Mountain National Forest, Vermont. My existence, for now, was secret to most. As a member of an elite task force that hunted and tracked monsters, I knew secrecy ensured our success. Laughter filled the woods as my team gathered around the fire. One of them, Andromeda, shared another witty tale from her childhood in Serbia. While we waited for our orders, I glanced at their faces stoic Jacobina, energetic Ridley, and reserved Myron. I never thought hunting monsters would pay off my student loans. I chimed in. Scattered chuckles followed my words. Our banter ripped through the ominous atmosphere like moonlight through the darkness. Our leader, known as Braxilius Smithwick III, entered the clearing with an intense look in his eyes. A weathered man in his fifties with silver hair and a beard, Brax had the gaze of a skilled predator. He whispered to each of us with due severity, It's come to our attention that there have been a series of mysterious disappearances within the forest. The locals believe it's an animal or maybe even an escaped convict. Brax added as he circled the fire pit with measured steps. Tonight is not going to be a simple camping trip. Our laughter faded into silence as we absorbed this information. Remembering those who had inexplicably disappeared made something churn inside me. We were no strangers to horror. It was our job to confront it head on. As nightfall crept in, Ridley and Jack Cabina checked their weapons, handguns, and heavy rifles ready for any nightmare that crossed our path. We moved deeper into the woods following Brax's lead by using walkie-talkies to relay information back to headquarters under a code name. Sharon. Andromeda navigated us using GPS while Myron scoured for clues. We approached the heart of the forest where moonlight pierced the canopy leaving silver trails on the damp ground. Reports claimed a man named Alarico had been found here, mangled almost beyond recognition. It was then I realized how interconnected our lives were with those of their perpetrators. It's eerily quiet, Jacobina remarked with an ominous tone as we reached Alarico's body site. Other than a ladybug fluttering past, there were few signs of life. Brax inspected bloodied leaves, trying to decipher the mind of an unknown assailant. The attack seems haphazard, but there are some specific patterns in the wounds. Andromeda chimed in with her usual cautiousness. It could be an unregistered monster or creature. Suddenly, the bushes rustled nearby causing us to instantly shift into action mode. Guns and flashlights scanned the darkness like lighthouses in a foggy sea. Crack! A twig snapped just ahead, and we cautiously proceeded forward. My stomach churned with equal parts tension and anticipation. What awaited us? Ridley took point as we traced our possible suspect's path deeper into the woods. Heavy breaths lingered in the air like whispers from horrors unknown. We turned around a large oak tree only to see an immense three-legged figure almost blended among the shadows. The towering monster leered down at us through gleaming crimson eyes, dripping toxic saliva that hissed upon touching moist earth below. My heart pounded against my ribs as I aimed my rifle at the creature while Brax barked out orders into his walkie-talkie. While part of me expected at least a semblance of humanity, 
even if only in monstrous form what emerged from darkness defied expectations with unearthly precision. The acrid smell of boiling flesh wafted into our nostrils as liquid venom spewed from the creature's gaping maw. The menacing roar lingered heavily, challenging us head-on. It lunged towards us, massive claws reaching for Myron. Rifles and handguns blared simultaneously, filling the night with a cacophony akin to Thunderstorm's symphony. The bullets sunk into its thick hide, yet it seemed unhindered and unstoppable. Myron narrowly avoided the creature's grasp, diving out of the way as its enormous claws slashed through the air where he had been moments before. Seeing our friend barely escape death, we understood that running away was our only option. With weapons raised, we backed away, desperate to find any kind of cover. As we retreated, my mind reeled. What was this creature? I knew nothing about folklore or mythological beasts. Yet, this nightmarish being that was hunting us seemed to have stepped straight from a twisted tale. It didn't make logical sense, but neither did denying its existence in front of my very eyes. Despite the dread that gripped me, I couldn't ignore the practicalities of our situation. We needed help. Brax had been attempting to contact headquarters through his walkie-talkie, but static filled the airwaves. No one could hear his urgent pleas amidst the chaos. The beast charged at us once again, and Ridley fired a well-placed shot into its eye, momentarily halting its advance. The creature roared in pain, releasing an ear-shattering sound that made our bones vibrate with force. The ground trembled beneath our feet. Our mad retreat led us into a nearby cave where we found refuge behind rock formations and prayed for a temporary respite from the monstrous predator outside. In hushed tones, we discussed our limited options. We can't keep running forever, Myron whispered emphatically. This thing will track us down eventually and kill us all. We can't fight it with conventional weapons, Ridley added somberly. We've tried everything. Bullets don't do anything. Just as Ridley finished speaking, the entrance to the cave darkened with the immense silhouette of our enemy looming large against the dim light outside. Noticing some stalactites hanging precariously above the monster's head, I motioned for my team to divert their fire towards them. Bullets and debris flew above the beast's head as we unloaded our remaining ammunition on our makeshift trap. With a gut-wrenching crack, the stalactites broke free, tumbling down onto the beast's skull, impaling its grotesque face. Seemingly oblivious to the new wounds, it shook off the debris and continued its terrible advance. Our despair deepened as we recognized that we might not survive to tell our story. Without warning, the waning light pouring into the cave intensified as multiple searchlights flooded the area. A barely audible hum rose above the wind's howl, a fleet of helicopters approaching our location. As if sensing that its reign of terror would soon be over, the monster let out a roar so chilling that tears sprang to my eyes. With surprising grace for its size, it scrambled toward us with renewed fury. But the cavalry had arrived. Bullets poured from helicopter-mounted machine guns, and though they still seemed to have little effect on the creature itself, their sheer force pushed it back away from us. The whirling blades grew louder and larger until they filled my vision and drowned out all other sounds. It was then that I finally allowed myself to believe that we had been rescued, that our nightmare was over. By some miracle, we all survived our encounter with that monstrous beast, though its image still haunts our dreams. We never learned what exactly it was or where it had come from, perhaps keeping well away from any effort to try to understand would grant us some safety. In time, our wounds healed physically, but mentally, we were changed forever. We couldn't forget those who had perished in other encounters with this creature, the friends and colleagues for whom victory had come too late. 
The events of that night remain cloaked in secrecy. Even now, having seen firsthand what horrors can lurk in dark corners of the world, I struggle to recount such a story without being doubted or dismissed as a man and. But in the end, something undeniable remained, whether it was the result of an experiment gone wrong or some twisted force of nature, we had all witnessed firsthand that the unknown can be more terrifying than the things we understand. For all our progress and knowledge, there remain hidden dangers lurking in unseen corners, monsters that defy reason and explanation, striking at our deepest fears with unimaginable savagery.